Welcome to the first day of our spring argument session here in Pittsburgh. As you all may know, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is the oldest Supreme Court in the nation, and in fact, in North America. Our roots date back to William Penn's Provincial Court in 1684, and the Supreme Court was formally established pursuant to the Pennsylvania Judiciary Act of 1722. Last year, we celebrated our 300th anniversary in Philadelphia. We sit today in Pittsburgh City County Building, a granite Art Deco building which was designed by renowned local ar architect Henry Hornbossel. The City County Building houses the executive, legislative, and judicial offices for both the City of Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Architect Edward B. Lee was responsible for the design of this magnificent courtroom, the wooden oblongs, the fluted columns, and the bench and bar are all mahogany. Behind the bench is a beautiful mural of our state's coat of arms. That same coat of arms is carved into the justices' chairs and individual elements are represented in wood medallions on the bench, specifically a ship carrying the state's commerce to the world, a plow working our rich natural resources, three golden sheaves of wheat representing our state's fertile fields and our citizens' wealth of human thought and action. And finally, an American bald eagle demonstrating Pennsylvania's loyalty to the United States. The murals in this room were all painted by local artist Edward Trumbull. On the ceiling, you will see three great lawgivers, all framed in gilded plaster. Furthest from the bench is the Byzantine Emperor Justinian, famed for the Reformation and codification of Roman law. In the center is Moses, seated and holding the Ten Commandments. And finally, closest to the bench is the English King Edward I, who spent much of his reign reforming the common law. To the left of the bench, you will see a mural depicting William Penn, founder of Pennsylvania, and to the right, William Pitt, the first Earl of Chatham, who was held in high esteem with the American colonists after publicly supporting many of their positions. The city of Pittsburgh is the namesake of William Pitt. It is truly an honor for our Supreme Court to sit and work in three beautiful courtrooms in Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and Pittsburgh, and we welcome you all here today to Pittsburgh. Before we hear the first case, I would like to remind counsel of just a few things. Appellant's counsel, please approach the bench, approach the podium when your case is called. I will then give a short summary of your case. You may then begin by stating. The justices are familiar with your cases, so I ask that you avoid any unnecessary recitation of facts or procedural history, and instead focus on the main issues on which we granted review. Counsel is welcome to rely on their briefs for particular issues. In cases in which there are multiple parties represented by separate counsel, please avoid repeating the same argument as your prior counsel. I ask that you not interrupt the justices when they are asking a question. A justice's question is not meant to trip you up. It rather indicates that there are particular issues that we want to explore further. While there is no set time limit for argument in this court, I will advise counsel when the court is satisfied that all of its questions have been answered, and at that time I ask that you conclude your argument. Mr. Minner, would you please call the first case? Thank you. In this appeal, we consider whether a report from ShotSpotter, a system that purports to show the time and location of a shooting incident, which was offered as substantive evidence at trial, is testimonial in nature and thus subject to the confrontation clause protections of the state and federal constitutions. Please proceed. Uh, good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Justin Romano on behalf of Appellant Angela Whedon. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying it is a distinct 
privileged to argue before this court for the first time today. Welcome. Uh, to orient the court, uh, I'd like to um, address a, a definition of testimony that was articulated by this court in Commonwealth versus Brown, which I think sets an appropriate framework for the conversation we're going to have today. And in that case, testimony was defined as a solemn declaration or affirmation made for the purpose of establishing or proving some fact. And I think that's really the lens through which we need to, to consider the shot spotter investigative lead summary, which is the key piece of evidence um, before the court today. Um, I would note that it's attached as Appendix Exhibit D in Appellant's Brief if you're interested in looking at the specific document we're referencing. Um, but for the purposes of our argument, I think there are really three uh, unique characteristics of this particular report um, that the court must consider in ultimately determining uh, whether confrontation clause protections do attach. Um, the first is that there's an undisputed human review component to this report. I know that there's a growing body of case law addressing machine generated evidence, but in this particular case with this particular report, we know that there's a human being from ShotSpotter called an incident reviewer who looks at the data generated by the machine, ultimately makes a determination based upon his or her training and experience, and concludes whether gunshots were fired based upon the audio. Mr. Uh, Romano, data. I know that I asked you not to go into the facts in detail, but could you just briefly describe what the spot, shot spotter is? Of course, Your Honor. Uh, shot spotter technology is audio detection technology. They're highly sensitive speakers typically placed on, on telephone poles, um, and, and, and the purpose of them is to detect what are believed to be gunshots. Um, they hear sounds um, that, that um, their suspicion uh, uh, of, of uh, being a relation to shots fired, and it triangulates lo the location and ultimately determines um, whether a police response is necessary. So it's an aid to law enforcement to help them have a, a quick response to an emergent situation? That's correct, that's correct. Um, but an important distinguishing characteristic is the audio technology or the audio detection um, um, is not what gets transmitted to law enforcement in this instance or others. It's ultimately reviewed by a human who says, these are gunshots, we need you to respond to do an investigation to solve the crime or render aid to someone who may be injured. But isn't that the extent of the human involvement? The evaluators sitting in California look at, a, um, look at data coming through immediately and determine uh, it's gunshot or it's some other sound. Isn't that the extent of the human involvement? Well, there's potentially two components of human involvement. There's the initial incident review, uh, which determines whether these sounds are a car backfiring or they're gunshots or a helicopter flying by. There's a potential second forensic engineering review that can occur in certain cases. Now, the trial record illustrates that there was no forensic review in this case, so we know that never took place. So the, the data report or data summary which was later printed out and then later admitted as evidence um, is not, there's no evidence that it was altered in any way from simply the data report of what was heard. Is, well, that, is that correct? I'm glad you asked that, Your Honor, because it's an important point. There's no evidence that was altered because there was no evidence at trial about whether any review occurred, period. But counsel, and doesn't that bring us to the question, is this not more of an evidentiary issue of authentication as opposed to constitutional? confrontation? It is to a degree, Your Honor, but they're not mutually exclusive because the authentication issue relies upon uh, uh, confrontation to ultimately challenge that authentication. As Your Honor knows, authentication is a pretty low barrier. So to have someone come in and say the shot spotter investigative lead summary report is what it looks like, like is one consideration. But when we're talking about a constitutional analysis and confrontation clause, it goes a step further. Um, and can we clarify that authentication was not an issue in this case because it isn't raised in the appeals? Even though the amicus argue about it, it's not before us. That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, counsel, how could it not be before us? Are you, you're, you're challenging the reliability of this uh, technology. That's correct. Well, how do you challenge the reliability without raising the authenticity issue under the rules of evidence? Well, they're different considerations, Your Honor. I understand that, but the way to challenge reliability is through an authentication challenge, right? It, well, in this particular instance, our, our objection was based upon hearsay and confrontation. 
Um, the hearsay issue was resolved at the Superior Court. The only issue preserved and present before the court today is the confrontation issue. Um, our position today is Angela Whedon's constitutional rights were violated because he couldn't challenge the evidence that was presented against him. Now, it's important to keep in mind here that the Commonwealth has the, the obligation to, to uh, present evidence that's reliable. They only, have a significant only if, burden. Only if you raise the issue. I mean, they don't have to bring in a, an authentication uh, uh, expert or uh, testimony unless somebody raises the issue. What was your precise objection when the, when the uh, testimony was offered? It was the hearsay in violation of the confrontation clause. I articulated, I tried the case, I articulated to Judge Rangos here in Pittsburgh that without a meaningful way to cross-examine a witness who understood this review process, this undisputed human review process, my client would be prejudiced. His constitutional rights would be violated. Those were the specific um, uh, objections that were articulated there in the trial record. If you look at the document on its face, it's very clear that it wasn't intended to be trial evidence. It says that it's specifically for investigative purposes. I was going to say, counsel, is there, isn't there a disclaimer on the last page? There is, Your Honor. There's Could you share with us what the disclaimer is? Because that was not part of the record. Well, it was as evidence, but the disclaimer itself was not introduced, I don't believe. It was, Your Honor. It's addressed in the briefing specifically. Oh, I know. Um, but it does say that, uh, and, and I'll quote here, the summary should only be used for an initial investigative purposes because of the shot timing, location, and count could differ once reviewed by a shot spotter forensic engineer. Um, it, it says elsewhere that certain alterations by shot spotter employees can be made to the original data. And that's our point here. There is a human review component. If we're playing 911 audio tapes and it's just sounds for the interpretation of the jury, that's one thing. That's raw data. And the Commonwealth argues we're talking about raw data here, but we're not. We're taking raw data and we're taking it one step further. We're interpreting it through a human lens. An incident reviewer, at the very least, is saying, What I hear based upon my training as shot spotter leads me to believe that these were gunshots and not some other similar, <laughs> similar comparable noise. What happens in a case where the shot spotter transmits data to these people sitting around? I, I just envision them somewhere sitting around a garage waiting to hear this tape. I know that's <laughs> not how it really is, but when they hear the tape, they conclude not gunshots, probably uh, backfiring from a truck. What happens to the data then? Does it go to the police or is that the end of it? Your Honor, I don't know the answer to that, and that's exactly it's a good question. That's exactly it? it's a it's a fantastic question, and that's exactly at the core of this. If there are a witness who were involved in that review in the courtroom when my client was tried, I would have asked them that on cross examination, and we would have learned and educated the jury about what do they look at, what do they listen for, what are the review criteria, how do you distinguish, how do you make a decision to dispatch police? You know, maybe they didn't do the review that day. Maybe they were sick. You know, maybe. What was supposed to happen didn't happen, but what we know is there was a city of Pittsburgh police officer that testified to this who had no personal involvement in preparing this. He had no personal knowledge about whether the review occurred. I'd like to move on to harmless error, but let me ask first if my colleagues have any further questions on the shot spotter report. I do. Uh, could you uh, tie together your confrontation clause issue with the hearsay objection that you raised and aren't they distinct? I mean, for a confrontation uh, clause challenge, uh, you need uh, testimony that is, uh, you need testimonial uh, aspect of the, and, and the, the courts ruled below that this was non-testimonial. Sure, Your Honor, happy to draw a distinction there. Um, we ultimately did not pursue the hearsay issue in light of the court's determination in Wallace. I know there was a decision from this court just recently that- Well, that's why I asked you earlier because I didn't think that issue was before us. It is not. It is not, Your Honor. And I'm happy to elaborate on why um, that was not raised in the petition for review. Well, that's okay. I mean, I, I, that's why I was a little bit confused because sure. I thought we had a pure confrontation clause issue before us. That's correct. The hearsay objection was raised at the trial court. It was argued at the Superior Court. It was not raised before this court. So our position today is this is narrowed to a confrontation clause issue. Um, our position is also that the Superior Court erred in determining that this particular evidence was not testimonial in nature. And there are a couple key characteristics that are relevant to that 
specific question. Um, the first is that the date of this report is July 3rd, 2019. The incident in question was December 15th, 2018. That's just when it was printed though, isn't it? Well, we don't know that, Your Honor, because there was never a witness in court to be asked about it. So this is all tied together. <laughs> Sure. Uh, to a degree, it may be, but the fundamental point here is we need a witness. We need a witness to be present in a courtroom who's knowledgeable about these issues so they can be cross examined on these points. If there's no one who's present to speak to when this report was prepared, then we don't have the ability to do that. That's the confrontation problem. By raising an authenticity issue to the trial court, it drives the. Um, objection on that basis, which would allow the trial court to either rule on that or would convince the Commonwealth that they needed to come in with a witness to resolve your issues or your questions. Um, on this record, um, I'm kind of siding with uh, Justice Donahue when she um, said, isn't that an authenticity issue? We had no reason to believe when we tried the case that this shot spotter investigative lead summary was not what it purported to be from an authenticity standpoint. Uh, we had no reason to believe that. Where the, the, the constitutional question arose was, was there a human review? Did the process as designed get followed by shot spotter in reaching a conclusion that gunshots were fired? And that's a critical piece of this too. This report refers to gunshot shots trigger pull throughout the document. Counsel, didn't Commonwealth detectives testify that every detection of a shot spider goes through a human operator? Yes. During the discovery process, did you request who that human operator was? We did not. We did not. Um, for the first time, we heard that testimony at the trial. Oh, okay. Yes. That's correct. So the testimony, I specifically cross-examined Detective Baumgart on that point. Is it true that every, do you know whether this one did specifically? No. Do you know who the human reviewer is? No. And the human, the person working for ShotSpotter, this individual will determine based upon hundreds of hours of training whether they believe it is a gunshot as opposed to a, another, another large sound. Of that's my understanding, Your Honor, yes. But Counsel, we don't have that issue before us. That's why I keep getting back to this point. I mean, you may have a, a valid uh, uh, hearsay issue here because this is really different than a GPS system because there is in, indeed a human element in actually generating the information. But that's not before us. I mean, as I understand this, the question before us is what was the primary purpose of the spot shotter? If the lower courts were correct, it, it, it was that it's intended to address emergent situations, that's its primary purpose, then it's non-testimonial. I mean, I, I, I like your hearsay argument, I like the authentic, uh, authenticity argument also, but I just don't see that in the case that we have before us. Tell me how I'm wrong about that. Well, Your Honor, there's, there, <laughs> there's a, a couple different shot spotter communications, and admittedly the record is, is not fully developed on this point. There was a wire deer mid-trial where we dealt with this issue. Um, when sound is detected pursuant to the shot spotter system, within seconds, according to shot spotter, it's reviewed and there's a dispatch made to law enforcement in that area. So they can respond to an emergent situation. This is the primary purpose analysis. That looks different than this report, which based upon the only evidence of record, including the date on it, was generated some time later. There's no evidence of record that this report was specifically what was generated in real time to allow those officers to respond. Furthermore, this report is not just, we heard sounds at this location at this time. It's we heard gunshots, which is a conclusion made by a human being but that's not the Confrontation Clause argument. Your Confrontation Clause argument has to be the report is distinguishable from the spot shotter uh, analysis that takes place at uh, dispatchers, uh, police officers. I mean, I, I, 
I don't know how else to get to this uh, question that the report, uh, you're saying the report is testimonial? That's and correct. And distinguishable from the um, dispatch call that goes out to respond to the emerging situation. I, I, is that accurate? That's correct, Your Honor. So the report is distinguishable from what the lower course described as a response to an emerging situation. That's correct. And based upon the trial record, there's no evidence that this report was what was given to officers in real time. So when we're talking about the primary purpose, if that were in fact the case, evidence should have been presented by the Commonwealth to reflect that, but it wasn't. So the Superior Court made a, a, a logical leap without sufficient evidence of record that this was what was sent to those officers to respond. Counsel, counsel, the, the issue before this court is specifically involving the investigative lead summary and whether that's testimonial. The question I have for you is that throughout the briefs, I learned that there's a more detailed forensic report, which both sides admit is a court admissible document after it's been through forensic uh, experts or engineers. The question I have is how do you distinguish the lead investigative summary from the detailed forensic report with regard to the testimonial nature of its substantive introduction of substantive evidence. Your Honor, there was no forensic engineering report completed in this case. The investigative lead summary was as far as it went. And as you aptly pointed out earlier in the argument, this was never intended to be admissible in court. It was an investigative tool. This is used um, um, to solve crimes potentially. It's not a trial admissible document. So the Commonwealth that doesn't determine, though, if it's admissible, does it? It does not, but it tells you what ShotSpotter thinks about it. Um, and there's no evidence that ShotSpotter ever intended this document to be an admissible document in court. And I just want to make one distinction here. If during the trial of this case, the Commonwealth played the ShotSpotter recordings of gunshots, bang, bang, I would have no problem with that. That would not be objectionable. That's... That's evidence, that's data, that's not a conclusion that's filtered through a shot spotter employee. That doesn't violate the confrontation clause whatsoever, but when this data gets filtered through a human reviewer and a conclusion gets reached, that's when it becomes testimonial. Okay, Mr. Romano, I believe Justice Robson has a question for you. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I just wanna follow up on the testimonial aspect of it because I'm, I'm sort of seeing what Justice Donnie here is seeing is sort of this intertwining of the hearsay issue with um, the confrontation clause issue. The question about whether, <coughs> excuse me, the document is testimonial, is that determined <coughs> by the purpose for which the document was created or is the question more what was the purpose for which the document was used at trial? Um, because I, I, think, I think the record is fairly, I, I thought the record was pretty clear that that document was not what the officers received when they responded to the, uh, the shot spotter thing. Um, how does your confrontation clause position um, supported or not supported by how the prosecutors used the document at trial? Was it used for purposes of simply showing why the police officers responded, in which case it was a purely investigative tool or was it used to establish that shots were fired at that location, which seems to me to be a fact relevant to the conviction? Our position on this, Your Honor, is it was used to prove past events. And that's the definition of a testimonial statement. Was it created sometime after the fact? Or was it not created to respond to an ongoing emergency? And the case law is pretty clear that if that's the case, and that goes back to Crawford, if that's the but how was it used at trial? How, was it was it was it was it used to sort of provide this sequence of events? We received a shot spotter notification. Uh, we responded um, to alleged gunshots, and here's by the way the shot spotter report that indicates the data that we received and why we responded. Or was it shots were fired at the location? Here's a shot spotter report, report to prove it. It was used to prove that shots were fired from a specific location at a specific time to corroborate other witness testimony. 
And that raises an interesting point here, and it's argued throughout the briefs that this was a service. Probably takes us to where the chief wants to go on harmless error. <laughs> I think that's a fair transition, <laughs> Your Honor. Oh, thank you for this. <laughs> uh, it, Let's talk a moment about harmless error, if we may. Of course. Mr. Romano, the Commonwealth points to um, lots of evidence that would render this harmless error, even if we were to agree with you that there was an error in the introduction and use of the shot spotter uh, report. And uh, what the Commonwealth is citing is the fact that uh, it was testified that Appellant's ex-girlfriend and her friend testified that, Appelli, that Appellant had cut off their vehicle, tried to enter their car, and fired shots at them when they sped away. The women then immediately drove to a police station where they were visibly shaken and afraid and the crime scene unit observed two bullet strikes in the rear passenger side of Lamb's vehicle, of the appellant's vehicle, I'm sorry, of the victim's vehicle, and the photographs of the same were admitted at trial. So tell me, if you can, why that is not harmless error. Your Honor, uh, the burden is on the Commonwealth with respect to the harmless error analysis to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the jury could not have considered this evidence in reaching a conclusion. The body of case law on harmless error is, 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 is uh, littered with direct evidence. This might have been a constitutional violation, but someone else saw the crime being committed. That's not the case here. The prosecutor who tried the case specifically referenced the shot spotter investigative lead summary in his opening. He argued about it in his closing, and on top of that, the jury asked the specific question about this report during their deliberations. And this was a recent development. Um, I just discovered the actual written question about three weeks ago. I filed a motion to correct the record and it was transmitted in a supplement on April 5th. So I don't know if that made it before the court. But we know that the jury was considering this specific piece of evidence because they asked a question during their deliberations. Unless the Commonwealth can overcome that and say, we know beyond a reasonable doubt today before this court that they didn't use this evidence in reaching their conclusion, it's not harmless error. And that's just the state of the law. Okay, we'll see what uh, the district attorney has to say about that. Any other questions for Mr. Romano? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honors. Nice job, Mr. Romano, yes. for your nice First job. Argument, yes, Very nice, nice job. job. <laughs> Very good. And this is your 110th <laughs> argument? <laughs> I'm getting up there. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Frank Nepa for the Commonwealth. Uh, just uh, uh, for what it's worth, I can answer the question that you had about what happens if the uh, incident reviewer uh, thinks there are uh, fireworks or a car or something. There would be no report. Okay. Um, anyway. Is that, in, is that in the record? No, that's why I said for what it's worth. Okay. Well, but there would be, there would, there would also be no report not only would there be no document that was admitted at trial here, there would have been no notification to the police. That's what I meant. There would be no notification. So there is a human being reviewing data, deciding whether a report should be generated. Yes, we're yes, we're not denying it. There so is where it, who was that? Who who was that person? That, uh, I don't know the name of the person. There was a shot spotter employee. The only human involvement in this matter was. At the time that shots were detected by the shot spotter sensors, a human reviewer uh, makes the decision uh, whether or not they are gunshots or not. If they're not, there would be nothing submitted to the police. If there is, they send that back to the they send that data back to the police for the police to act. So, on. isn't that the big problem here? There was this is this is not just the data set. The reason why police responded was not because shots were fired was because some person somewhere listened to some sound and determined that in their judgment um, that shots were fired and maybe shots were likely fired, pressed a button, they pressed the green button instead of the red button, mm -hmm. um, notification went to the police and because that notification was sent, a report could be or would be generated. That's why right. isn't that, that why, why doesn't the defense counsel have the right to confront that person who put that series of events into motion? Because that action or that statement by the, um, by that human reviewer 
is not testimonial because this was clearly an ongoing emergency, and that's the key. <clears throat> but that's not why you offered it. How, why did you, why, why you, you used that determination by this person, this, this event, this choice um, by this person as evidence of shots being fired, substantive evidence of the crime. I'm not sure what you mean by that. that's not why we offered it. I mean, why did you offer it? I was just going to say, if I, did, I did you cut it. What, what was the purpose of its introduction? The purpose is to establish, we're not denying that the purpose was to establish that shots were fired, but in Crawford v. Washington, wasn't the purpose of uh, putting in that uh, victim's statement to show that the defendant was at her house? Commonwealth. Yes. The concern that I had is that it was introduced that this investigative summary is only to the, the initial criminal investigation. So it's the report that was a concern based upon this triangulated sound for the police to go to a particular area in Pittsburgh, and that was it. You already have the testimony of the police officers not only going to the scene, but coming up and meeting the complainants and observing the damage and all that. The evidence also indicated that a detailed forensic report, which you all conceded was the court admissible document, which was reviewed by a forensic engineer or expert for its introduction that in fact it was a shot. So the question that I find is, how can you say you're not introducing it as substantive evidence as, the, as you said, the actual shots fired when its purpose through shot spotter is only to announce or to give notice to the police department that there may be criminal activity about. I don't think I said that that wasn't the purpose that we introduced it. I, I think it was introduced as substantive evidence. So why didn't you introduce the forensic report that, there, it, that everybody concedes is a court admissible document? I, we wouldn't be here. I think as uh, Mr. Romano said to you, there was no forensic report. There was no forensic report in this case. I'm not sure what you're referring to. There are instances where there can be, but there was not well, I think that's Justice Doherty's point is, is it seems like the shot spotter, even shot spotter doesn't believe that this document you used should be admitted at trial. If you want to admit it, something at trial, you have to admit the forensic report. There was no forensic report done in this case, so you decided to try to admit the document that you shouldn't have tried to admit. Well, I think that isn't that a challenge to the scientific nature or the science behind or underlying no, no, shot, shot spotter? Shot spotter doesn't believe it should be admitted at trial. And I know the Chief Justice is correct that that doesn't necessarily matter. But I kind of go back to the point is you wouldn't have that report if a human being, whether – I don't even know what the qualifications of this person is. Whether a human, if a human being had not pushed the green button instead of the red button, that report wouldn't exist. Your, that evidence wouldn't exist. So it's really the fact, it's not just a data set that, it's not like you introduced the sound. You introduced a report that was generated as a result of a human per person pressing the green button instead of the red button because that human being reviewed the sound yeah. and made a determination that, yeah, that's, that's likely gunshots. But that is not behavior. Under the case law, that is not the sort of thing that has been determined to be testimonial. That, that seems to fly in the face of Melendez, Diaz, Bullcoming, and the whole line of SCOTUS cases because it's been clearly established, and there's no dispute in this case, that a human touched this and a human interpreted, in fact, um, something that hasn't been um, put to you is the interesting uh, fact that the initial report recorded three sounds and that this unnamed unknown person over in California and somewhere um, did a judgmental calculation, an interpretation based presumably on some expertise the defendant did not get to explore on cross and determined that there were only two gunshots. Isn't the fact that this incident review went from three ostensible gunshots to two through the prism of human interpretation a confrontation problem for you? 
Number one, I don't know that that's true. If, if, you, if there's something that says that, I don't know that. Well, it's the in, it, I, yeah, it's the incident review in the record, which has all those disclaimers attached to it that uh, Mr. Romano was asked about. I don't think the incident, I don't think that report says there were three shots. I think that says that there were three sensors. Three sounds. I think those are the three sensors that picked up the, t the two sounds. But be that as it may, even if, the, even if the incident reviewer changed it from three shots to two shots, that still does not run afoul of the confrontation clause. That does not, bull, that does not violate bull, com uh, bull coming and Melendez-Diaz. In those cases, that was somebody after the fact sitting down to do a detailed analysis of, of in, in, in Melendez-Diaz, that was an, an analysis of the substance that had already been linked to the, the, the defendant. Mr. And Napa, could you contrast or compare this case with our recent uh, opinion in Commonwealth versus Wallace uh, looking at the GPS data? I can, uh, all I can say is that Wallace certainly doesn't hurt the position. The Commonwealth today, in fact, uh, you, you stated in, um, in Wallace that any concerns about the reliability of machine generated information is not a confrontation clause matter. So I think that case dooms the position uh, offered by the uh, uh, appellant, at, at least limited to the, uh, uh, human. At, yes, at least limited to the, the uh, science of, of shot spotting. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. It just, I just keep coming back to this human piece, this yeah. human involvement mm -hmm. and, 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 I don't know how you're getting around the fact that someone, okay, so these sounds come in and they get picked up over in California and some human with some training has to listen to the audio yeah. and make a determination. Is that a truck? You know, could that be a, a somebody dropping a, a forklift? A, a split second determination. Um, an interpretive judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, that then gets relayed uh, to somebody in dispatch here in Pittsburgh, and then investigations commence. Um, I, I just that seems to me to be this kind of solemn, the solemn declaration that SCOTUS has been talking about that that requires an opportunity to confront. I, I don't know how the trial court and Detective Baumgart um, could have ruled out. The fact that 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 piece, that human piece out there in California, was something the defendant had an opportunity to confront. I'm just not getting that. But he or she was not doing that to establish prior events for a later prosecution. They were doing that to help deal with an ongoing emergency. The she w he or she was not trying to bring Mr. Whedon into court. She was trying to get police out there to maybe stop an active shooter or to treat injured victims. Ah, but now they are. Because now as a result of what you have done with this report, mm -hmm. ShotSpotter now knows that these reports are going to be used by prosecutors at trial. So now they know when they make this split-second judgment and they push the red green button instead of the red, that a report is going to be generated that is going to be used at trial because you've done it. But that is still not their primary purpose. Well, how do, how do we know that? Well, I, I mean, there's a, there are shots. You used fired. it for that purpose. You used the report that has all these disclaimers in there, that ShotSpotter designed this whole thing because they probably didn't want their people to be called to testify. You have now told ShotSpotter and you have told everyone in the country that's using this that Oh, these reports where we all were told it's just a tool and everything like that, they are now evidence at trial of a substantive fact in the trial, and now that person sitting in California knows when they push the green button, I'm, I'm going to generate a report that's going to be used at trial. That still does not mean that that is the primary purpose for doing it. Could you ask that again? I'm sorry.
in theory that could happen. It did not happen here. I think that I think I'm agreeing with you. Because we are, you, at least according to these cases, we look at the primary purpose uh, of the the human involved in the, in these matters, and 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 in in in. Um, Brown, which was the autopsy case, the primary purpose of the of the medical examiner who did all the testing uh, on the body to determine that it was a murder, the primary purpose of that action was to uh, determine uh, or prove certain things that will be later used at a trial. That was not the primary purpose of this human reviewer who if you look at the uh, at the sheet, thir within 30 seconds, she's making that determination and sending the information to the police. So it, they're not the same sort of thing. The, Counsel, what can I, can mm -hmm. I, this is rank hearsay. I mean, <laughs> pure and simple. I mean, you had somebody testify what somebody in California said happened at this night on this at this place, and it was based upon that person's judgment call. I mean, I, that doesn't make it a confrontation clause issue, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, I, I tend to uh, agree with the analysis that this occurs to get police on the spot as quickly as possible, no harm. But if they're right, then the police are on the scene where shots have just been fired. I mean, that's my understanding of what this uh, technology is intended for. Uh, but do we have a hearsay issue before us in this case? I don't know. Um, I'm only, I was only addressing the issue as framed by the court and in my opponent's brief. I guess I haven't thought about it enough because it was not, I was not asked to address that. Right, and, and this, this is not like the GPS case. The GPS case is a technology issue, mm -hmm. purely and simply. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you know, that, that case is what it is, but that is not what sh uh, shot spotter is. I agree there is a different component, to the, an added component to this the one. The critical component is a person making a judgment call as to whether or not what they're hearing is gunfire or not. Yeah, I, I guess it would it come down to does that, is that considered a statement? I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't thought about it enough to give you a real good answer to that question because, again, it was not, it's not before the court. It was not before me. And we don't even know, we don't even know that there wasn't additional human involvement because the defense never get to cross-examine. Never, got, and when Detective Baumgart was asked, he didn't know, of course. So um, we don't know uh, behind that kitchen door how many cooks were in that kitchen. And and again, I, the fact that the investigation commenced as a result of the shot spotter technology um, is not dispositive of the confrontation clause issue because the use at trial is what determines the analysis for constitutional purposes, isn't it? I disagree with you in that we do know because the detective testified that there was nothing um, in, there was, not, there was no more data that, than was on the page. Nothing transpired after the moment that these shots were fired. Well, how could he have possibly known what went on over a shot spotter? I don't understand what you mean. He, he was able to, he, he knows that the shot spotter sensors um, detected the number of shots and the location of these shots and the time of these shots. And he knows that there was nothing other than that on that report. Does he testify that he believed, he used the word believed, he believed the report was reviewed and he was unable to say for certain what happened in this case since he doesn't work there? At another point, I think on page 109, he said there was no data included within the exhibit that was not the result of automatic generation by ShotSpotter's computer system. And and the, the, the report itself, if you look at the if you look at the uh, express language written on the report, it says 
that the following shot count times and locations are automatically calculated by the shot spotter system at the time of detection. So there was nothing, there's not one single piece of data um, that on that on that page that was not automatically generated by Mr. Shotspot. Mr. it <laughs> seems that this case is uh, somewhat complicated by the fact that we keep wanting to dip into reliability, authenticity, hearsay when that was not raised by the appellant. Yes, I agree. Well, hearsay uh, was raised. He hearsay was raised. At the trial court right. level, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that's why I'm asking you if inherent in this confrontation clause issue that we have before us, is there the hearsay objection that was raised? Is it a uh, subsidiary issue to the issue that we accepted on <coughs> appeal? N not, that I, not that I can see, um, not that I can see. I think, you know, it's sort of like the qu question here is, is this more like a 911 call or is it more like the autopsy report we dealt with in Brown? And, and, and it, 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 given this human piece, this human review, and this fact that we went from three sounds to two, um, and that we don't know what went on at ShotSpotter, it's, it, it looks a lot more like the autopsy report than a 911 call from where I'm sitting. Yeah, not to me. Um, I mean, the, 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 the I'm the surprised. The, 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 the coroner's actions. Well, yeah. Justice I mean, Wecht is much more familiar with autopsy reports. <laughs> <laughs> the medical right. examiner's actions are not uh, comparable to a split-second decision or a 30-second decision by this human reviewer. So do we I know, but one more question, if I may, mm -hmm. pardon me. Um, do we know from the trial record uh, that, I guess what's been assumed here, um, that there was simply a button push six months later. In other words, do we know with certainty from the trial record that there was no human involvement in the time interval between the shot report back in uh, whatever month that was, uh, back in December, mm -hmm. uh, and the date of the report on July? Do we have any knowledge from, knowledge from the record of, of what went on in that six months? Are we just assuming um, that it was a push button. Just from what I told you of what the detective testified, uh, or the detective testifying saying there was nothing included on this report that was not part of automatic generation at the time that the shots were detected and also that piece of language from the, from the report itself. Well, what, well, how do we go from three to, three to two? Again, I don't know that that's true. I don't know that that's true. I think it's just three sensors, not three shots. That's my reading. So that's not the adjustment of the round count? You see when that, you know, that piece you were reading to us, this, the next sentence says, uh, the number of individual shots below may not match the round count reported on page one, because on page one, we see the sensor picking up three, right? And then on the next page, uh, we see two. So it says, if an incident reviewer adjusted the round count during incident review, prior to publication. I don't think the round count was adjusted in this case. I think there was always two. That's my position on that. C can we get back to a question that was asked early on, um, but from a different angle? Why did you offer, I, and I'm sure you were not trial counsel, I am was I correct? Not. Why was this offered into evidence? Is there a harmless error issue here or not? I, yeah, I, I certainly think there was it, if you had a problem with the introduction of this, I certainly think there was harmless error because these women ran to the police station and the officer knew, could tell they were in distress and they were saying, this, my ex just shot at my car. The it car wasn't has, a random shooter. It they wasn't a random shooter. Identified. They had, uh, she had two bullets in the. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. The defense put on an alibi, his girlfriend and the girlfriend's child correct. to say, so the, oh, when you say it's harmless error, it has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So right now all we have is girlfriend and child versus girlfriend and child saying he did it, he didn't do it. And the incriminating piece of evidence that is overwhelming is a hearsay report that shot spot that you introduce indicating that some man in California believed shots were fired in Pittsburgh. Well, you would have to believe that the girlfriend got her friend to not only 
uh, lie and run into the police station with her and tell a police officer that, hey, this, this guy just shot at our car, you would have to also believe that the trained police officer who observed them couldn't tell no, that they No, 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 you're talking weight given to the testimony here. We're talking the, introduc the, the introduction of evidence for harmless error purposes. So the question becomes, it, it, it looks incredible. I guess the question becomes, if you're so overwhelming with the evidence, why was it introduced, which is the initial <laughs> question. Therefore, the only reason it was introduced is because you knew there was going to be a solid defense of an alibi. And you had to put something in there to, to and that you introduced it for substantive purposes to bolster the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. So I, I, I don't see a harmless error issue here. I can't specifically answer the question as to why it was introduced. Well, let me, let me finish, say on that. Let me finish this one second, Justice Weck. Following up on Justice Doherty's question, the shots fired data would not help or hurt his alibi. The shots fired data simply showed that shots were fired somewhere by someone. Um, that really didn't go to the, the certainly don't incident like that the, the, the uh, credibility question of whether sure it he was the shooter It, it or supports not. The, the, the Commonwealth's case that shots were fired and you, and you had the two bullets in the car. Well, of course it does. That's the, that's the issue. No, it no. would have been he said, she said versus he said. We would have had girlfriend and child versus girlfriend and child without the introduction of this report. Okay. And that in and of itself proves to me that there's no harmless error here. We would okay, have had well girlfriend. We'll discuss may that uh, back there. May I, may I put my question? Do you want to proceed, Justice Wick? Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder if it's a teaching moment for the Commonwealth because it's not the first case I've seen where uh, the evidence is quite strong for the prosecution and it seems like uh, error was unnecessarily sown. It's almost like um, a party getting greedy. So you, 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 know, you could have established with the detective and other Commonwealth witnesses the reasons for police response and then built your case compellingly without the need to bring in this testimonial report because now, as Justice Doherty has pointed out, we must apply our Mitchell precedent which says that the evidence must be uncontradicted to allow you to get over the harmless error problem. The presence of the alibi testimony here by the girlfriend and her son unnecessarily means that the evidence is contradicted. It doesn't matter what the weight and the credibility aspects are, there was contradiction. So my point is, uh, haven't you, I don't mean you personally, ha hasn't the Commonwealth unnecessarily caused itself a problem by using this investigative resource for substantive evidence purposes at trial. I'm not a trial attorney, but I think my colleagues would tell you that they never know what a jury is going to do. So they would not say, oh, let me just leave this out. This, this, is, this is legitimate. I'm going to put it in. And, and so they would probably not make the distinction that, that you're suggesting. I think that's what you're saying. I think the uh, officer who testified called them bullet strikes. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not just girlfriend and ex versus girlfriend and ex, it's girlfriend and ex and bullet strikes in the side of the car versus girlfriend and child. Now, counsel, can I ask you one more question? Sure. And I'm doing this, putting myself in jeopardy of aggravating Justice Doherty, but I'm going to go back to, th <laughs> to this question. Assuming that the evidence is, uh, co is uh, contradicted, but evidence is admitted that turns out to be improperly admitted, but it doesn't go to resolve a contradiction because in this case, the spot shotter report didn't identify who shot. Correct. It just said there were shots. Right. So that being said, um, how does that fit into an har a harmless error analysis when otherwise you have contradicted evidence, but the, the improperly admitted evidence doesn't go to resolve either one of the, of the contradictory statements? Well, I don't know if this answers your question, but I, I certainly don't think there can never be harmless error when the defense puts on a defense. I don't think just because somebody 
said somebody comes in and makes up a, an alibi offense, that doesn't mean there can never be harmless error. I don't think that's the case. I don't think the law says that. So I do not, I, I think harmless error is a, a, a viable thing here. Did a tremendous job, and we're going to figure this out. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In these consolidated appeals, uh, we look at the interpretation of Rule of Civil Procedure 213.1, which governs the coordination of civil actions filed in different counties. We must examine whether a trial court has the discretion to coordinate actions that have not yet been filed at the time coordination is sought. We further determine which parties are authorized by Rule 213.1 to seek the coordination of actions filed in different counties. Does that sound like this case? Very much so. Good. <laughs> Just <laughs> took my opening, Your Honor. Please proceed. With all due respect, it is a privilege to be before you all today. Um, may it please the court and the justice of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania <laughs> and justices. As you said in your opening, this is a procedural issue in 1990. My associate, Lauren Nichols, who helped do a little, most of the briefing, was three years old when this came about. We're going to be dealing with other statutes and uh, federal matters that go back to 1968 when the federal MDL came in, which, just for the record, I was seven years old. <laughs> so we're dealing with this, and uh, so it's- Chief Justice Vaughn. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was older than you, with all respect to the matter. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I do feel my age anymore, especially on a day dog today outside. <laughs> so let's get to what we're dealing with. This is a rule that has been around since 1990. It's very rarely used. But what you have to look at before you look at the rule is the mechanism of how you interpret this rule. And the way you interpret this rule is under Rule 127 of the Rules of Civil Procedure. And the object of all interpretations of the rules is to ascertain and effectuate the intention of the Supreme Court. So that's why we're here today, because you, as a Supreme Court, have to give us the guidance. With all due respect, none of you were sitting on the Supreme Court in 1990. So we can't go back in the time clock and ask them what they did or what the Rules Committee can do. But once we look at the, at the eight elements under 127, we can go to the explanatory notes in 213.1 to give us guidance. And that's where I'm going to put, Counsel, yes, Your Honor. Why, why do we do that? Uh, don't we only do that if the uh, words of the statute or in this case the rule are ambiguous? I was going to get to that. Well, is, is pending ambiguous? I believe it is. Okay, and why is that? Well, because if you look at the word pending, is it pending now? Is it pending during the course of the litigation? Is it eminent? Because if you look at the guidance, 
when they used 213, they looked at a federal MDL in the, in the, in the class action. And in those cases, the, the language- Two different things, correct? I mean, the, the MDL is what this is patterned, or not patterned after, but- It, 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 it is patterned. It's to capture it. It, it. it is patterned after, but because it uses the same verbiage and language. If you, if you compare them as was done in the brief, most of the language is similar, if not the same. And, and what they talk about in the MDL is tag-along cases, which is very important because if you look at what the MDL does and class actions do, state under 1708 and federal, is that does capture tag-along cases. It's all indicative of what is currently present when that judge receives the motion. Taking the statute as being plainly written and that the General Assembly did not mean pending to be an absurd introduction, share with me why I or this court should not read pending those cases that are with the motion for coordination, meaning future cases which are not considered well, because first off, there's no definition of pending. So you have to look at what the definition of pending is. And what this court has done and other courts have done is they've gone to dictionaries. And if you go to dictionaries and look, as we've set forth in our brief, pending has more than one meaning. But why wouldn't the General Assembly use future cases? Future cases. Well, this wasn't the General Assembly. This was done through the... That's what I'm saying. Well, if you would have done that, we, we, we have an issue that you would interpret that, whether that is appropriate. What we have to deal with here is what's what's the definition of pending, but Mr. Goodrich. Yes, following sir. Following up on Justice Dawkins' question, um, we, uh, before we get to the, the determination that it is ambiguous, um, uh, looking at the word, uh, we're free to make the judgment. I take it um, that it's unambiguous in one direction or another. Do you agree? Yes. And, and in that regard, so if I said to you, Mr. Goodrich. Do you have an action that's pending in the common in the court of common pleas? And you would say, and, and suppose you would say, no, I don't, but I have one that is impending. Or no, I have one no, I don't have one pending, but I'm gonna file one tomorrow. Could be eminent. Uh, could yeah. So um, do, do, do we not uh, in common parlance, at least in the context of litigation, yes, think of pending as something uh, apropos of what my colleague was saying something that's, that's there now as opposed to something that will be there tomorrow. Well, I, I, I will answer that this way, Justice Weck. You have to look at the whole picture. And I think when you look at this, you have to look at something common sense. Why would you take, say, if you have two actions pending in Allegheny and Butler County, but you know because there's a pandemic and there's gonna be a, a wealth, which ended up being a wealth of cases, why would you cut your nose off to spite your face and say, we're only gonna do two of them, but we're not gonna do the others? Well, and further, wouldn't it frustrate the whole purpose of the coordination That's what I was getting rule because if, under, if you didn't include actions that are tag-alongs that are about to be filed? Well, exactly, and that's the point of the common sense approach to this because when you're modeling something after an MDL that specifically talks about tag-along cases, it's in the soup. Yeah, I think that's a very fine point that you and the chief were just covering, Mr. Goodrich. I, I think it's an excellent point. Um, uh, but I wonder if um, that's a bug or a feature of the rule. In other words, is that mischief that we created by writing the rule this way and does it require us either to amend the rule uh, at, while in the meantime you file serial coordination motions? In other words, it may not be convenient or most efficient, but there is nothing that would bar 
um, plaintiffs from bringing serial motions to coordinate. It's Absolutely. Under D2, it specifically talks under the factual scenarios that you could have cases that are ready for trial, cases that are in discovery picture. But th the other issue is that the uniqueness of this rule is let's not sell the common plea judges short. This rule gives them the ability to look at the factual scenario and make a case-by-case -case determination. That's why under D3, th make any other appropriate order. That's a case-by-case -case analysis, which you have to look at depending on the circumstances and the facts. When you're dealing with a pandemic and you have families that are losing their businesses and they're, they're not getting insurance benefits that they believe they're entitled to. No, I do not for this reason, because there's a mechanism. When you take King's bench, it's one order and it's taken in. That's what you said. Oh, and you, I'm going to take this case and every other type of case against Erie Insurance. But there's, the but there's due process here that you have to look at. It's, it's, when I was a young lawyer, there was something that I was taught. It's called motions practice. When, when a case is taken or that, that it's notified that it's going to be taken, similar to what happened in the opioid case, which came, came through the coordinating case and was okayed in Commonwealth Court. Just, now Justice Brobson oversaw that on a different procedural issue, but dealt with the coordination of opioid cases and the coordinating court stayed all pending cases. Now we're in the future. What is so different about that happening at this hearing? And there, isn't there a possibility that objections can be made or That's isn't it provided that objections could be it, made by it, it, any it, of these uh, attorneys in these additional In the cases? MDL it's, it's done and Judge Ward in her opinion. And it's funny that the same thing is in the MDL, the 14 days and the 30 days is exactly what Judge Ward modeled her order under relative to if we're saying we're going to take your case, you have 30 days from notice or 14 days to file your objection. And then there will be a hearing. So that means that the Oliver Scott, that means a single practitioner in, say, Union Valley or Cali has to file a petition out in Allegheny County and is required to travel to Allegheny County to litigate this motion despite the fact that the lawyer filed his petition or he wants to file his petition immediately for us. He's a single practitioner in the state. Now, let's look at the real practice. Right. What we're doing, are we not stymieing, one, the choice of venue, which is in place for King, and two, again, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how that this court has not provided a singular judge with a form of King's bench authority for future cases. I got the consolidation of the judicial case. I got that. We call that mass tort insurance. Yes. I, I believe you are with all due respect for this reason. This is a coordination order. This is not a class action order. This is on the, the, the issue here is the co commonality under number one, the commonality to prevent overburdening the Pennsylvania court system with multiple cases of like and similar causes and uh, legal issues. Well, so. There may or may not be. There was a motion filed, but that has not even been discussed or argued yet. That's within this judge's discretion to create a lead counsel in violation of, uh, you know, not being a civil, I mean, a bad practice. Uh, 
uh, I believe we'd have to go under either the rules of class action 1708 or th there would be an argument on that. And, and if any party is aggrieved, then they can file an appeal on that. But the issue that we're dealing with today, Your Honor, is whether or not the rules that were promulgated by the Supreme Court provide for this. And I think that the Superior Court said, yes, it does. Now, that said only for the 13 cases that were filed, not the other 65 that are filed and the hundreds that are unfiled because of the class action status that we filed. And can I just follow up? Just, just, I just want to be sure of something. Um, you do agree that, um, that if we were to disagree with you on the pending, impending distinction uh, on, the, on that issue, um, that the trial, that the coordinating judge here would still have the opportunity to issue subsequent orders capturing cases filed in Futuro. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And, and counsel, let me follow up on that because it's for that reason uh, that I think uh, your argument uh, holds water because I cannot discern a reason why we would provide a rule where any party could coordinate subsequently filed actions, but the court can't do it ab initio. And, and uh, it, that's the part of this that I think uh, rings true with what you're suggesting here, and that is how MDLs work. Yes. I mean, I, I was involved in many of them when I was a trial attorney, and yes, in fact, you could end up uh, being in a court in Chicago, although you filed your case in the Western District of Pennsylvania, but it's because of the commonality of facts and issues. What Judge Ward did here is a little bit unusual, is she consolidated it for all purposes, including trial of an issue. Now, she could change that order at any point in time. Absolutely. And, 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 and determine and the preliminary issues. And it's remanded for that issue on whether or not that's going to happen. But those arguments were not heard because the appeal was filed, which stayed everything in common police court. But that's in her discretion also. I at believe any it point is. In time, when she as long as it's not an abuse of discretion, which is the standard here. Right. See, that's the question is, it, I, I, again, uh, I don't think there's any question about the intent and, and the efficiency and all that. The question, or a question here, is whether, because unlike the MDL scenario, where the rules, the rules for MDLs actually talk about future cases. Yes. Um, not the statute, but the rules. Um, the question is whether this rule, the word pending, can be used to extend to those. Again, that you didn't mess up, but we might have messed up by writing the rule. Well, no, you, 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 with all due respect, you weren't on the Supreme Court. We were all right. children. Right. <laughs> 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 but let me ask you this. Pending. Is it pending now or is it pending after they're filed about it? What's pending? Is it now or is it later? If well, it's that's pending. why I think you have to read it uh, so that you have uh, the court having the same ability as any party would have mm -hmm. consequent to uh, subsequently filed actions, it, actions uh, filed after the original coordination. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let me answer it this way, uh, Madam Justice. The order from Judge Ward says that once a new case is filed against the defendant, because the defendant Erie Insurance would get notice of the filing, <coughs> is under obligation to notify Judge Ward's chambers her, that the case is filed. Yes. So if it's Delaware, it's Delaware, and then we're notified, the judge would issue an order, and then the uh, lawyers, either party, plaintiff or defendant, in Delaware County can either object or acquiesce and do nothing. Could I ask you something that I, quite, I don't quite understand about the rule, and maybe you can clear it up for me. It makes sense to me factually, uh, circumstantially, when you have a big county like Allegheny and the civil um, division administrative judge, Christine Ward, entering this order. 
What if the initial order is entered in Tioga County or Elk County where they don't have the resources to handle all these? How does this, how does this work, work in that? Great state? question for okay. this reason. The rule provides that it could be, the case can be transferred, the body of the case can be transferred to any other county. But the filing for the coordination has to be in the case of first, the court of first impression or the court of the first filing. Which could be a small county. Yes, it can be. And there's, there, there, if you look at it, there was, so if there's one case filed in P P Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, there's one in Tioga, her, her honors home, home uh, county, and there's 20 filed in Philadelphia. But Pittsburgh was the first one, and Judge Ward looks at it and says, well, we have one in Pittsburgh, we have one in Tioga, but we have 20 in Philadelphia. It makes more judicial sense for economy that it goes to Philadelphia. Then the case can be moved there. That is part of the discretion of the, of the Thank you for court. And that's why I said you can't sell the common police court judges. Well, wait a minute. But it, I can't because what if sure. the Philadelphia judge got rejected? We don't have to accept your man's court case. No. Well, then it would go back. The administrative judge of Philadelphia can, supervising judge, will decide whether we're accepting your cases. So in that hypothetical proposed by this court, what happens when Philadelphia County says, we don't want those cases? I don't think the rules provide for, an, for a yay or nay, Justice. I think the rule says that they, the judge in the original jurisdiction has the authority to transfer. Because one of the issues by us, because you know, as Justice Doherty was asking you about that. It's like in, th in this case, quite frankly, I envision this to be on the coverage issue. And at that point, because that is the, if, if we lose, and that's a case that's potentially pending appeal to you, what we're doing here is exercise in ac academics. You're right. If you guys do not take the case or if you deem there's no coverage. So th that's the issue with that. But it does streamline instead of having 67 cases filed in 67 counties and 67 courts litigating the same issue of whether or not the eight words in an insurance policy binds the Erie or doesn't bind Erie. That's what this coordination is doing. It can be for this or other issues, and that can always be reviewed because, as I said, the judge can make any other appropriate order at any time in the proceeding, just like a common police judge can do. Counsel, you, you may know this uh, since you've been uh, operating in, in this area. How many times are you aware of that this uh, rule has been invoked? It's the first time I've ever done it. As, as my associate said, she, uh, she said, boss, how long have you been practicing law? I said, 36 years. Have you ever done this? No. You ever think you're going to do it again? I said, probably not. <laughs> I, I hope not. I have not. Are there any other questions for me? I, I have one other question, just so I'm clear. Um, just assume for the sake of discussion that the coverage issue is decided in your favor. Most of these cases are going to go back to the county in which they were filed because there are going to be factual defenses. Yes, yes. I, and that, I, those, those, that aspect of each case will be tried in the county in which it was originally filed. I'm not putting the cart before the horse because without the liability, we have no damages. So we have to look at that issue. And uh, or answer Justice Doherty's, <laughs> I don't intend on traveling to 67 counties at 62 years old or 60 whatever years I am doing these cases on a case by case analysis. But I, I just don't, question, but that, I think it it, they're going to go, go back. back. It will go back. I, I am not the judge that signs an order, but I foresee that they would go back. I, I foresee that they would go back because. Uh, there may be co-counsel, there may be other. The damages are going to be different. They're going to be more specific on a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, if there's nothing else on that issue, I just want to address very briefly, any party is any party. This has been raised. I think the Superior Court has it right. Uh, it's very specific. I, I think there is no ambiguity in that term, any party. It says it throughout that either party can file. So, uh, I think the Superior Court had that correct when they said that any party means any party, and that's what it is. The due process argument that has been raised by the defendants, I have uh, addressed that. I think Justice Weck brought it up also that there is a motions practice mechanism for the objection to be heard, and if they're unhappy with that, then there's the appellate process. So I, I think those are two issues that I'd like to say. 
And, and last but not least, um, the Superior Court um, issued dicta. I, don't, I think that should be ignored by your court. There is nothing pending after they made a decision to return the case uh, for further analysis on the objections and what the uh, dependency issue was. And um, it's, it's just dicta. And uh, that's their advisory opinion that it should hold no bearing on the Common Police Court. What okay. part of it is dicta? Uh, when they're saying that you can't issue an order that's not even an order yet on the, whether or not there's a class action. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay thank you very much, thank Mr. You. Goodrich. Let's hear from thank Mr. Thank you for Sam. the honor again. Madam Chief Justice, Justice of the Supreme Court, good morning. Frederick Santorelli, and with me is Tara Machusek of the DeBell firm. We're here for Erie, the Appalachee. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, addressing Justice uh, Donahue, your, your statement of how often has this rule been, been, uh, been utilized. I mean, I have used it in the past, and I've only used this rule where the party who seeks to transfer the venue of another action in which they are a party, they file a motion. It's the only time it's ever been done. Give me, give me an example. Make up a hypothetical. So I understand okay, what so, so there's, a, there's a, a, a contract, an employment agreement. Mm -hmm. And in the employment agreement, there's a restrictive covenant. Mm -hmm. And the employer, uh, after there's a separation from the employment, the employer wants to file a declaratory judgment saying that the restrictive covenant is, uh, is enforceable. And then the employee uh, would file a separate case in a separate county saying, well, you fired me for no good reason, and therefore I got a claim for damages. Now you have two, you have a disagreement over venue over a case that's really the same. One of the parties wants to uh, litigate in one county. The other party wants to litigate in the other county. They're obviously forum shopping. That's where this rule comes into play, is where there's a disagreement over where to litigate. The explanatory comment says just that. Well, but the explanatory comment also talks about the background of uh, the federal MDL and the intent to capture that without going through the elaborate uh, development of, of uh, rules to uh, effectuate that intent, leaving it up to the judgment of the courts of common pleas to work it out. Yeah, the, the, the I mean, the example that you, uh, that's, uh, that's not only forum shopping, that's, uh, you know, an attempt to uh, game the system. Yeah. Uh, that's really not what this is, was intended to to capture. This was intended to capture the multi-district litigation concept. I disagree with that, Your okay. Honor, uh, because the explanatory comment explicitly talks about, it mentions the MDL and says, no, we're not doing, we don't have an MDL. And I, mind, I remind everyone that the MDL is based upon a statute that Congress passed to create a panel. And, in the, and I've been in the MDLs myself as well. And in the MDL, there are a set of rules. There's 26 separate rules that dictate all the processes that apply when you're in an MDL. The for future actions. For future actions, there's a whole process set up. We have none of that here. And I think the, 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 the intent of this rule is not to create an MDL. The explanatory comment does not say that. Isn't it, isn't I read it the case that the rule probably was intended to prevent parties from bringing motions to this court. In other words, to, it, uh, uh, wouldn't it be likely that this rule was to avoid this court having to entertain motions from litigants uh, to determine which county it should, to let the trial courts try to figure it out? That's, that's, that's how it's functioning, and that's how it's been functioning, whenever it's, in, uh, whenever it's used. And, and l l let me say with the MDL, uh, uh, Justice Donahue, you know, there are, um, all 50 states obviously have to deal with, with these issues at some point. There are 13 states who have actual MDL type rules that look nothing like this. This is an outlier. This is not one of those. In those 13 states, you know, New York, California, Indiana, Texas, there's a nice law review article, Northwestern uh, Law Review, uh, published 2021 after this case but it surveys all of those states, and you'll see how they're all different from this. This is very not like an MDL. And if the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, when it promulgated this rule, intended to create one, this is not how you do it. And I agree with Justice Sweck, you know, 
I was thinking about the rules committee because having served on there, this is exactly what we would do in assisting the court in trying to write a rule where one doesn't exist. This is not an MDL rule. If you want one, we know how to do it. We would do it with a lot of study of other jurisdictions, how they do it, and we would work in these tag-along procedures, these future cases procedures, who can file the motion, and we would do it orderly. Why what doesn't this rule do that? I mean, I, I, you know, saying it's not an MDL rule doesn't make it not an MDL rule. Uh, I mean, this anticipates the coordination of cases that have common questions of law or fact, and it designates the first filed county as the appropriate forum in which to litigate those cases. That's I mean, as, what, what else do you need? That's about where it ends, though. Well, yeah, but, it, but this also provides that any party, and I know you're going to disagree with this, but assume for the sake of our discussion, uh, this also provides that any party after consolidation can move to have a subsequently filed case coordinated in the first filed county. So I'm, I'm just sort of groping for what more is necessary. Yeah, so, so any party would be a party who wants its case transferred. In, in, in our state rules, we do respect the, the choice of a plaintiff when they choose their form. In this situation, if you read it this way, the way you're saying, that doesn't matter anymore. Mr. Goodrich and his clients are not parties to any of those other cases. There's about 60 of them out there. So we can assume there's in the 50s who don't want their cases taken from their own home county where they filed them. The Munley plaintiffs are referenced in the briefs. There's 19 of them now in Lackawanna County. They want to be there. This rule gives a party to the case whose venue is sought to be transferred, gives that plaintiff the opportunity or the defendant to say, I want to file this motion because I think my case is similar enough to these other cases. I want to go to Allegheny County or some other county Can to I litigate it. A question on how that would work. Um, so you mentioned in the Lackawanna situation, uh, prompts me to ask you. So supposing you won and on, on this appeal and supposing that um, Judge Ward here was in the position to encounter serial coordination motions or uh, uh, you know, subsequent um, actions to seek coordination. Uh, and would, would there be a, a scenario then when the judge here would be in communication with the judge, say, in Lackawanna to discuss whether those cases should stay in Lackawanna or be coordinated here? How, how in your experience or in your expectation, would that work? Well, in a, in a um, uh, federal NDL where we have rules like that, where th that's a contemplated and there are processes where that happens. Uh, the panel will actually speak to the other county judges or the district judges in the federal system, would speak to them and say, hey, can you handle these kind of cases? Do you have room for this and that? That's done. None of that exists here, number one. Uh, it, number two, the party uh, the, the party who files the motion can file that mo tomorrow. They can start filing these motions, and that would generate the dialogue with the court. The party plaintiff in uh, Lackawanna County can file one of these motions. Now there's no question of who has notice. Of course they have notice. They're filing the motion. The defendant has notice. Now everyone can talk to the trial judge in Allegheny County and assert their position. Whether they can reach out and speak to the judge in the uh, other county, there's just nothing in the rules that authorize that. I there's guess nothing. Mr. Goodrich's point in that regard, though, uh, if I may, is just that that, that creates an unnecessary uh, potential for jurisdictional tiffs, right? If, if in his judgment, um, that would be, that possibility would be cut off because the judge here would make that call. Am I right? Yeah, the, the, the judge here is authorized to uh, make the call, assuming he has a proper motion before it, by a proper party in a pending action. Counsel, if the, if the purpose behind this, and I don't think there's any question, I mean, this is to promote j judicial efficiency, but more importantly, to prevent contradictory decisions coming out of various courts of common pleas. I mean, assuming that sooner or later, these cases are gonna be coordinated somewhere. I mean, if you have uh, different courts of common pleas deciding different variations of whether or not there's coverage, there are going to be multiple appeals. 
and there's going to be a coordination, or, or are you suggesting that the first case that reaches the Superior Court is going to be the case that controls the outcome of all of the other cases uh, in terms of that coverage issue? See, that to me is far more unfair than having a coordination in the, the, the forum of first decision where you get a uniform uh, ruling on a question of law that then goes up in you know one fell swoop to the superior court and then maybe to this court. But sooner or later, uh, there, there is going to be a coordination as to a determination of the issue. And to me, to have the trial court make that first determination with the participation of all of the cases that have been filed, then that goes up and you have uh, a decision that's being reviewed where there was participation by all of the parties and all of the actions filed in the various courts of common pleas. Ron, you're, you're assuming that the, the issues are the same across all these cases. We haven't even gotten to well, that. That's, that's a different but they're not the same. Well, so it, maybe it should go up in their home counties because there are going to be different issues in different cases. And to say that you're going to have one judge, judge 60 different cases or 1,000 different cases, assuming that the same issue ad that she addresses here is going to apply wait, to all wait, the others, wait, that's wait, not the case here. Wait, wait a minute. I mean, uh, it, uh, what we have coordinated here are cases involving the same policy language. Am I correct on that? In some ways it's the same, in some ways it's not. Some have exclusions, well, that's some why have different uh, other issues. But, but, well, but the, the original coverage language is the same, correct? Well, the, 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 the there may be exceptions, and that may be a reason why somebody opts out of or the court allows that party to opt out. For example, there, uh, in, in this case, there was uh, someone who objected because uh, it was their position that the, their case was controlled by Delaware law but, but not Pennsylvania law. It's a good reason not to coordinate that case. Right. Okay. Th that, that, you know, and, and certainly a judge in the Court of Common Pleas would recognize that distinction in terms of a coordination issue. But, I mean, don't we have policy language that's consistent across the board? In, in, in a, a lot of the cases that, that I'm aware of, I'm not handling all 60 of them, mm -hmm. but uh, the policy, there is common policy language. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the case is different and in a lot of ways. That's a different issue, though. I mean, and I mentioned that earlier. Judge Ward entered an order consolidating for all purposes, including trial. That may right. have been aggressive in the first instance, but that's not etched in stone either. Yeah. And, and, and I'll, uh, let me add this, Your Honor. There, there, the cases actually are being decided, mm -hmm. and they're doing fine in the regular system that we have. There's cases, there's alicotters pending actually now in front of your honor. Well, there you go. How many? There, there is uh, uh, the Hungarian case is against CNA and the... But we're only talking about Erie, right? And Erie... Here, yeah. yeah, and the Erie case is, is, is McMiles. Now, there's two petitions for alicotter pending now. Um, Superior Court, by the way, we won in the Superior Court shutout, 9 nothing on en banc opinion, saying that there is no coverage. In, and is that going to bind every Erie policyholder, whether I, or not they were involved in that particular piece of litigation? Getting back to my point about coordinating at the trial court level. And, and ironically, I'm going to support the plaintiffs. <laughs> every plaintiff has a right to make that argument when the case comes back, if their, their case is pending in another court. The plaintiff can say, well, wait, my policy is a little bit different, or my facts are a little bit different, but if we take this coordination order, you're taking that out. They're, they're, the plaintiffs are stuck with what happens. Well, they, they may, Your Honor. I, I'm, I'm not prejudging those cases now, but if, if a plaintiff wants to say, no, my, my language has a different, I had a different endorsement in there, or my broker misrepresented the coverage to me when I bought it, those cases are actually pending. But that's a different issue. 
I mean, w w you know, I, and you know, you, we're talking about we're, we're ships passing in the night here. I mean, I don't know what the Superior Court decision was, but my guess is that they ruled on a particular phrase within the coverage as to whether or not this was a physical uh, injury. Okay, I mean. That's, that's okay. the, the main ruling, yes. Okay, everybody's bound by that on-bank decision whether or not they participated in that case. Now, some, e each individual plaintiff may have a different argument, but that's true if the case is consolidated at the trial court level also. Yes, it, 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 it would be true there. But let, let's get back to the basics here. Why are we doing all this when the system's working just fine the way the rule's written? Why are we trying to on the fly write a new rule and make it look like and smell like and sound like and act like the MDL when it's not written that way? And I say, let's get back to basics. When we look at this rule, look at the structure. Let's just read it. Subsection A says any party in a pending action can file this motion. That's the gatekeeper. When you read subsection A, if you can, if you are not a party in a pending action, you don't go to B, C, and D. It's as simple as the ABCs when you get down to it. You read the rule the way it's written. The subsection that they're seizing upon to say that creates a King's Bench point two, uh, 2.0, I agree with Justice Doherty, is tucked away in D3. It's a subsection of a subsection that says, make any appropriate order, any other appropriate order. Those five words are trying to convert that into some king's bench power where a judge who gets this motion can use those five words and say, I'm going to take every case from around the Commonwealth, regardless of the plaintiff's choice of venue, and I'm going to use that as my authority to say I now have MDL powers or king's bench powers. You don't read, I don't believe you can reasonably read the rule that way. Subsection A is the gatekeeper. Are you a party to an action whose, trans, whose venue is sought to be transferred? If you are, okay, come and file this motion if it's a pending case. If you don't satisfy subsection A and you read the rule the way it's written, you don't get to whether you're staying cases or whether you're transferring cases. It never happens. And it's important to read this rule correctly because it's a venue changing rule. And under 311C, we all know what that means. It's automatically appealable. And every time a judge takes one of these cases, these motions, and enters an order and changes venue on other cases where the people don't want to be changed, they want to stay home, there's going to be interlocutory appeals like you have here. Because if you don't appeal it, it's waived under 311G. So it's very important to get it right here. If you think this rule isn't written the way you want it to be written, the way you want it to work as a Supreme Court, we know how to do that. We have rules committees. We study it like the other states have, the 13 states who have MDLs. And then all the other states really are, are, are on the, doing it on the fly if they're doing it. We shouldn't do it that way. We don't need to do it that way. No one's getting hurt here. If you accept our interpretation of this rule, Things will go along just as they are going. They're going fine. There's no backlog in the, in the, the cases in this state right now as a result of this. Like Justice Dunn who said, this rule isn't used that often, but it's never, ever been used for the purposes that it's being used in this case. I might add the Delco, Opi the Delaware County opioid case and all the other cases they, they cite are clearly distinguishable there. The party making the motion is a party to the case whose venue was sought to be transferred. Hasn't happened here. If there's any other questions. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Good morning. This Good morning. appeal presents the issue of whether an employer who hosts an employee golf outing 
and requires employees who attend to make a monetary contribution to offset the costs of the event, including food, alcohol, and green fees, is liable to a third party who is injured by a guest who was provided alcohol at the event while visi visibly intoxicated. Good morning. Uh, Chief Justice Todd, Justices of the Supreme Court, um, opposing counsel, may it please the court. Uh, my name is Jim Manolis, and I represent the appellant in this case, David Clark, along with my co-counsel and my son, William Manolis. Um, it's an honor uh, to be before this uh, Supreme Court for the first time, and I appreciate the opportunity to articulate my client's position and, and make appropriate argument. Um, I think there's a few facts that need to be um, recognized by the court before I uh, begin my uh, argument. Um, this was an employer uh, that in addition to being unlicensed, was not eligible for a license, uh, invited employees, their families, and guests uh, to an employer-sponsored event, which required the payment of a fee uh, in exchange for which uh, food, beer, and soft drinks were provided. And the beer was provided on a self-serve, all-you-can-drink basis. And uh, Williams, who was the other defendant in the case, uh, was known by the employer to be an alcoholic. There's two broad issues involved here. Uh, first is the liability of a non-licensee under the Liquor Code, and particularly Section 493, as well as liability under the uh, common law uh, with respect to non-licensees. Um, the court is being asked here today to um, recognize that when a non-licensee provides alcohol, to a visibly intoxicated person for re remuneration, both the visibly intoxicated person and the non-licensed provider uh, may be liable to the injured innocent third party. Now, in order to um, uh, address this, uh, I, I think I need to say that the court has the ability under current law to um, uh, make that happen uh, uh, and also maintain consistency with uh, Section 493 of the Liquor Code. Section uh, 493 of the Liquor Code provides that it's unlawful for a licensee or any other person to sell, furnish, or give malt or brew beverages or permit malt or brew beverages to be sold, furnished, or given to any person visibly intoxicated or to any minor. Mr. Manolis, just yes. as a factual predicate, could yes. you clarify for me, in this case, Mr. Williams was not served by a bartender at the event, um, by a person who observed that he was visibly intoxicated. Rather, the beer and the alcohol was set out and he could help himself. Is that correct? Right. It was a serve yourself, drink all you want um, event. Was it alcohol or just beer? Just beer. And this was also a golf outing, correct? I'm sorry? This was also a golf outing. It was. And the contribution by each person was not only, as you said, for the alcohol, the beer and the food, but it was also for the use of the golf course, the equipment, correct? Um, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Manolis, just to follow up, in, in your view, does it make a difference legally whether um, the individual was served directly by someone at the event or whether he served himself? It doesn't make any difference insofar as liability is concerned. I think it's more egregious uh, from a uh, public policy standpoint if you just put buckets of beer out and let people drink as much as they can as opposed to serving it to those people so that you can monitor whether they're visibly at, intoxicated at point, or not. At what point is personal responsibility to enter here? That it's an adult coming to a course and he can enjoy an, an imbibing beer, but he's not being observed as a, say, bartender would observe, which is the gist of the Dram Shop Act. Right. So share with me, at what point is your client responsible for his own behavior? According to existing law, when there is remuneration uh, paid by the intoxicated person. For the specific sale of alcohol, yes or no? 
the, the sale, giving, or furnishing. That's Correct. what the statute of says. alcohol. It doesn't well, say golfing, social environment. The statute, the, 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 it's written, the liquor code is written specifically for the sale of alcohol, a.k.a. I accept your money with the sole purpose of you drinking. I go to a bar, I go to a frat party potentially, I give you money, I drink, I get drunk, you're responsible because I'm paying. This is a golf outing. So share with me how you, how this is not a social host scenario. Well, I, I think if beer is a component or alcohol of what you're getting in exchange for a fee, the individual or entity is in this case has a responsibility when they're accepting the fee to make sure that visibly intoxicated people are not served with the alcohol being provided. Um, the statute. Council, before you move on, th sure. this isn't a fee though. I mean, this is paying for what you get. It's like, you know, you're buying uh, a golf cart for the day, you're buying green mm -hmm. fees for the day, you're buying food. Uh, there's no profit generated. And, and I mean, my understanding is there's sort of factual findings that we're, we're stuck with. Well, we haven't got gotten to that place yet because this is a motion for judgment on the pleadings. But, I but think if you, you use the word fee, I mean, it's, I don't know, it, it, to me that uh, it implies uh, something that doesn't appear to be present here. This is, you know, you're paying for what you get. Well, that's a fee. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're, you're paying, paying an amount cost. of money you're to. You're paying the cost. Well, you're always paying the cost well, regardless of, you know, how you, if, you, if you pay for beer, you're paying the cost. That's really not the issue. Could I follow but up on that question? Sure. Um, because you're 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 making a lot of the term remuneration, which does not appear in the liquor code. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if we were to accept your argument um, and vary the facts a little, so I bring dinner to my friend's house and he serves wine. Um, what? Was I, was, was there remuneration there? Um, did my friend receive remuneration for the alcohol he served me? No, it, re, remuneration is a word that doesn't appear in the liquor code. It, it's consideration, which is um, something that is referred to with regard to the sale of alcohol. It's, it's providing alcohol for a consideration. Your example does not include any consideration being paid for the wine I brought an getting. Say I brought an expensive dinner, and in return, he provided the alcohol and overserved me. Wouldn't, if you win your case, wouldn't it extend to that scenario? Well, are, are you at a licensed establishment where you purchased the alcohol and provided it, or are you at home? Well, this, is this, this isn't a licensed liquor establishment. This isn't a liquor code establishment, right? This is a golf course. Yeah, right, well, it's a non-licensee. The employer right. utilized the golf course to hold the event. But I mean, what's the distinction? Alcohol. You want to blow up the social host exception. Um, I mean, I don't see the distinction. Uh, I, 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 let me put it this way. Um, if you win, so to speak here, um, wh where do the implications of that end? Well, what I'm saying is, well, first of all, the, the Klein cases, I think what you're talking about. In that case, it was a social host situation. Uh, the host was not, um, did, did not pay anything. And the, the court concluded that that was gratuitous. So um, even though it was, the court said that even if there's a duty not to serve the alcohol, that the service of the alcohol is not the proximate cause of the injury because somebody drank um, on their own without being, uh, they're the ones that are responsible for the injury. So under your argument then, if I may counsel, um, but you're saying you're, you're okay if I have a party um, and I overserve people, you're okay with me not being liable. But if I say folks, you know, try to contribute five or 10 bucks because I spent a lot of money to put this party on, under your theory, I'm liable. Yes. All right. And you, you can see that changes our case law, don't you? Uh, not necessarily, um, because in uh, Manning, the, the court indicated in that case that 
section 493 does not apply to a non-licensee who provides alcohol, alcohol to a visibly intoxicated person for no remuneration. And it left open the question of whether or not uh, uh, non-licensees uh, were responsible where renum remuneration is present. So I think this court could conclude that if remuneration is paid in that setting, it's a violation of section 493. Well, we left it to the General mm -hmm. Assembly and they passed on the opportunity many times. Well, I don't know about that. I think in the, the statute that we're discussing was adopted in 1951. I don't think there's been any amendments to that specific section. That's Justice Wex's point. Pardon me? That's Justice Wex's point. In Manning, we said, wow, this is a sea change. Uh, if anybody's going to make a change in this area of the law, it should be the legislature, and they haven't. Well, what's interesting about Manning is the statute's crystal clear, and Manning basically contorted it by taking out uh, claims that um, were, were based on um, a, a certain type of service, and they said the legislature should deal with it. When well, in they, fact didn't, the they didn't even look at the language of the statute. No, they didn't. Ne never talked about it. Never, never decided what person meant, as opposed to the Superior oh. Court decision in Randall that went through a line-by-line -line analysis, not only of the section in question, but the statute as a whole, and came to a completely opposite conclusion. Correct. But, but Manning applied it. Manning said that Section 493 applies um, to um, um, non-licensees who provide alcohol to a visibly intoxicated person for no remuneration. So they were saying that it doesn't apply under those circumstances, but they, they indicated that it it could apply if there was remuneration. Okay, did that overrule Randall? <coughs> no, they didn't really overrule Randall. Randall was a Randall uh, didn't involve remuneration. Right, but it was a, it was a superior court case and it, it, it involved a, a penal violation. I understand as that, opposed but to I mean, civil the exact liability. language was in play. I mean, did did Manning disavow the holding of Randall? No, Manning never discussed Randall, if I recall correctly. Well, d does that make a difference? If they're conflicting decisions on the same statutory language and the Supreme Court speaks to it, is, is Randall still good law? I don't know if it's ever, if, if the section of the code is ever enforced against no, non-licensees. I think it's the same. Other than in Randall. Yeah, I don't think so. Hey, Counsel, if I may ask you, do I understand your position to be in your pursuit of seeking damages against your client for the accident uh, and you're looking at the golf club. Your position is that any fee paid in essence for the cost of the golf club outing, which may include the incidental cost of alcohol to offset alcohol as a incidental of the event, despite the lack of evidence that Renew the, the money paid is, say, for the profit of the business in the sale of alcohol, that they are therefore responsible and negligent per se. Yes, I think if, uh, if, if they collect a fee for beer, they have a responsibility to make sure that visibly intoxicated persons are not served. Yeah. That, the, that's the, the that's not inconsistent. Say, the legislation says to sell, furnish, or give. And in other words, if if I may, just following up on that question, um, that the it, we're talking about the liquor code, right? So it's applying to the licensees of the board and employees and uh, the people of that ilk, so to speak. Well, and uh, any other person, or any other person, right? Which I guess it's your position that's anybody in the universe, which yes. would be nonsensical since it's in the liquor code because then why would they have had to say any licensee of the board they could have just said for any human being but be that as it may it doesn't say only to sell for money it says sell furnish or give so why aren't we looking at it at, at an exception to the at an exception to the common law social host rule that the general assembly created to say hey if our liquor control board's giving you a license, you and your people can't overserve people or you're going to be liable. And the rest, you know, the rest of the civil immunity is still out there in the common law. Why isn't that the appropriate 
determination because if otherwise, if you prevail, doesn't that open the floodgates? Well, here's the way we look at it. The court in Manning said that Section 493 does not apply to um, non-licensees who provide alcohol to visibly intoxicated persons for no remuneration. So basically what Manning did was took out the word, um, uh, indicated that furnish and give isn't sufficient to impose liability, but sale still is. They left the question open as to whether Section 493 applies to non-licensees where remuneration is present. And that's been, that's been um, acknowledged or recognized by Klein, which is a Supreme Court case, Al Alumni Associations, Capris, and Sites, which I cited in my brief. What Clar did was said it misinterpreted Manning and extended Manning to include um, that 493 does not apply to non-licensees who provide alcohol to a visibly intoxicated person for remuneration, basically holding its... Uh, uh, a pure penalty statute and doesn't doesn't have any application in a civil context, but it does. It it applies to any other person. It sets a standard for um, responsibility and can be relied upon for purposes of negligent per se. Um, Justice, now, Justice Weck has has raised a good point. I'm not sure you're I'm not sure you're addressing it specifically by going to the case law. Um, this is purely a statutory construction case, at least with regard to 493. Um, the Superior Court's decision in Randall, I think applied, or actually not applied, announced <laughs> the, the, the right statutory construction principle mm -hmm. that they should have applied, which is a justum generis, which right. is the idea that when you have a list of things followed by a general catch-all, you have to interpret the catch-all in relevant part to what preceded it. So I'm going to give you an idea on how this statute should be constructed, and you tell me why I'm wrong. Number one, it's in the liquor code, which is the idea you're regulating basically the sale of liquor. You're providing a license to people to engage in a licensed activity, and in return for that license, as Justice Weck pointed out, you're going to be held per se liable. Um, we're going to hold you to a higher degree of liability. That's the first principle. Second is everyone before any other person, everything that precedes it, are entities that are licensed or their agents that are licensed and, and, and can engage as a matter of grace from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the business of making a profit by selling alcohol. So to me, any other person has to include unlicensed entities that but for their um, failure to follow the liquor code are engaging in a licensed activity and therefore should be held liable just as much as a licensed entity would be if they engaged in that activity and, and served somebody visibly intoxicated. Um, how am I wrong on that? How am I wrong that any other person isn't really in, encompassed to, in, to get someone who operates a speakeasy, um, an unlicensed backroom area, engaging in licensed activity, even if they're giving their booze away, because we all know nowadays, if you go into a PLCB store on a Saturday, you're going to taste the latest margarita concoction for free. So how is this any other person shouldn't be interpreted to deal with the speakeasy situation only? Well, I, I, think, it, I think it deals with, it, it doesn't say any other person is limited in any respect. So well, any other person means any other person. Statutory construction says it has to be limited, or as Justice Weck would pointed out, the statute could easily read for any person to sell, furnish, or give alcohol. Though the, it doesn't say that. So we have to apply statutory construction principles to interpret any other person in light of what precedes it. I mean, that's just the law, right? Well, it says for any licensee, the board, or any employee, or any other person to sell. So it's including any other person. So any other person, that means non-licensees. So your in your view, in liquor. your view, the General Assembly just what they really meant was for any person to sell, furnish, or give any liquor or malt beverage, brewed beverages. That's. I, I, that's I, really what they meant, and all that other stuff is surplus. That's what Randall says, and I think that's clear. What has happened is well, Manning— Well, I'm not sure I, I, I'm not sure I agree with Randall. <laughs> well, I think I, I agree with I think I agree with Randall's use of the proper statutory construction principle, but I'm not sure they applied it correctly. 
Council, uh, just following up on that, uh, Randall uh, didn't only interpret Section 1 uh, of the provisions of the code. They, 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 interpret, they, they looked at it as part of the greater whole of the section dealing with unlawful activity. Subsection 4, which refers to peddling liquor or malt, or malt brewed beverages, says, period, for any person to hawk or peddle any liquor or malt or beverage, uh, brewed beverages in this commonwealth. Doesn't, uh, just uses the phrase any person, doesn't yes. refer anything before it. And I think what the Randall Court said was, wh when they meant to include only licensees, they clearly only included licensees. Right. If you look at the remainder of this section uh, that deals with unlawful activities, when they meant any person, they only said, they use the phrase person. So, I mean, I, 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 tend to, I, I tend to agree with Justice Bropson that if you look at subsection one in isolation, you do have to apply as justum generis. But was the Randall Court wrong in looking at the entirety of this section dealing with unlawful activities and coming to the conclusion that it came to? I don't think so. I think if you look at section one, the, the, the purpose that I uh, uh, glean from that from a legislative standpoint is that the legislature did not want anyone to serve alcohol to intoxicated people or minors. Don't we that's have to overrule Manning? I mean, I know you're making a no. distinction. Well, uh, you're making a distinction that the, uh, in Manning we said, we're going to overlook these words of the statute and say uh, it doesn't apply here, but we're going to leave open other words that are actually included in the statute and say, you know, that's for another day. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? I mean, uh, you know, how, how, do, how does the court say we're going to disregard this part of the statute, but leave for another day whether or not we're going to disregard the other p portion of the statute. Don't we have to overrule Manning? No, because Manning said that um, 493 does not apply to licensees who provide alcohol to a visibly intoxicated person for no remuneration. So basically what they said was you, I, I guess, even though the statute says you can't furnish or give alcohol. That's my point, but that's my point. The statute says furnish or give. Right, I mean, they, ju they just found that that should not be in enforced. It doesn't apply in a civil context, but, we're, but a you, sale does. You want does. us to be bound by a per curiam opinion that, that inserted, I, I, I don't mean to criticize you for this, <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just discerning your position. You, I take it, counsel, you want us to, um, to, to decide this case in your favor, predicated on this per curiam opinion, which, which added this remuneration factor which is not in the statute. In other words, well, let me let me put, let me ask it this way. Suppose suppose you go into your neighborhood, not you. Somebody goes into their neighborhood pub and the bartender likes them or takes a shine to them or whatever, gives them a free drink. I guess it happens sometimes, right? Isn't that the scenario that the general assembly might have been thinking about and furnish or give, right? Because there's no remuneration. It's just somebody who, you know, waltzes in and bartender or bartender's kid or whoever just you know gives them a free drink well there could be liability under this provision right even though there's been no remuneration or am I wrong to a license it, when it's a licensee when it's a non-licensee Man Manning says that it doesn't apply if it's for no remuneration so Manning is interpreting person in the same way that the Randall court interpreted person but it's just not going to apply it in the context of furnishing that's or giving. The way, that's the way I see it, and that's what Klein did too. Are we free to, <laughs> regardless of what our predecessors in Manning did, are we free to simply disregard the words furnish or give mm -hmm. that the legislature used and has not revised when it's revised this code 37 times since Well, I, I don't think that's the question in this case because it, there was a sale. There was remuneration here. So all you're doing is enforcing the statute by its terms. Your, your, your definition of remuneration is consideration. Right. It's not profit. No, profit has nothing to do with it. The, 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 the uh, liquor code defines sale as the furnishing of liquor for a consideration. 
So consideration is the same thing as remuneration. And that's the term that's been used by the courts to, to um, indicate what constitutes receiving something in exchange for alcohol. So, so that's back the to term Justice Wright's point, if I were to invite friends to a dinner party where I was going to serve good wine, but I said the only way you can come is if you bring an appetizer, that's the consideration. That would be remuneration. Under the liquor code, it would. But we're not talking uh, about a situation where you have a you know, purely social environment. This is a, an employer who invited people to, uh, in, not only the employees, but guests and friends to an event. I, I, you're, I, I know you're going to the facts, but I think the, the reason why this case is here is because we're trying to think about how the law you want us to announce will work. Mm -hmm. And are you now saying that that my hypothetical would only apply under the liquor code if I was the employer inviting my employees to the dinner party? That's the question in this particular but case. But that's not a rule of law, counsel. So, yeah. so in your scenario, so Justice, taking Justice Brobson's question, it seems to me that you would say he could be liable if the dinner party was for his law clerks, but not liable if the dinner party was for his social friends? Is that the rule of no, law? No, I think, I think you'd, you'd be liable. Uh, based on the liquor code existing law, you'd be liable. If you serve the person that you invited when they're visibly intoxicated and they got on, go out on the road and kill an innocent person. Well, that's, third an enormous, part. that's an enormous change in the mm -hmm. law of this Commonwealth. Is there any state that currently follows the, such a rule? I, I couldn't answer that. I didn't, I didn't check to okay. see whether Are other there any other follow. questions for Mr. Manola? Thank you very much, sir. We'll hear from uh, Mr. Simmons. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Brian Simmons here on behalf of uh, Dairy Farmers of America, and I have with me here today uh, Stephanie Patton from my office who actually drafted the appellate briefs, I, so I appreciate her assistance. Um, Justice Donahue. Well, can I ask a question? Maybe sure. next time she can argue. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I, you know what, Your Honor? I, I, I totally agree. I can, and she could probably do a better job here today. Oh, I doubt it. You're very good, but go ahead. I appreciate Sorry that, Your Honor. You actually asked the second question, Your Honor, here, and that is, Mr. Manolis, are you asking us to overrule the Manning decision? And that's exactly what he's asking you to do. Um, Manning and Klein are the cases that Judge Cox in Lawrence County uh, and Superior Court relied upon uh, to render the appropriate decision in this case, which is Dairy Farmers of America who does not engage at all in the sale or provision of alcohol, uh, held a golf outing for their employees. They should have served milk. <laughs> you're, right, you're right, Your Honor. If the, if the milk fermented, <laughs> maybe. Uh, I, I asked myself that same question when I took the case, Your Honor. But that being said, over the course of many years, of practicing law, I've attended many golf outings just like this. Frankly, I've hosted golf outings just like this. And you serve milkshakes though, right? <laughs> Not beer. No, no, with, with Bailey's, with Bailey's. Um, and and it, there is a, this would be a sea change in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, were this court to uh, overrule the Superior Court's decision. Um, there's, there's also some other things that bother me about the case, Your Honors, while I have you. Sure, sure, Your Honor. Let's just stick with, with, with that for a moment, because I think you led that you're not in the business of selling alcohol. Correct, Your Honor. You didn't say you were in the, um, you're not in the license business of selling alcohol. If, if you were uh, an organization that, has, um, that engages in lun licensed activity, but you're unlicensed, and then held this event, and we're giving away alcohol that you otherwise um, engage in the practice of selling, you would concede, maybe, maybe not, um, that, that you could be subject to this law. Yes, Your Honor, with, with the caveat that 
I would need to be doing this as, as some sort of a commercial venture. I think what the legislature intended and what this court intended in Manning, Klein, Congeni, uh, and the other, uh, the, the line 50 years worth of case law we have now uh, applying the social host doctrine is, and Judge Cox, his opinion's a very good one. Um, he mentioned that a rural, and Your Honor, you mentioned speakeasy, I call it an open saloon, and that's what the legislature called it in the liquor code, was an open saloon. You have an open saloon in 84 PA, which is where I, I hail from. PLCB hasn't been to 84 PA in decades. And I'm operating a open saloon. I'm taking people's money and I'm feeding them alcohol. That person goes out and kills somebody. I think the legislature did intend for me to be subject. I, I, I do. Well, maybe, maybe you didn't, you're an open saloon. You didn't charge them, but you were serving them alcohol anyway. So that's why I'm trying to get to the point of give, you know, because because I think I do think Manning, I think I think I'm not sure Manning necessarily needs to be overruled, but I think there's some confusing because some language that could be clarified. But if you were an open saloon, and I know of some of those places, never been, um, but uh, if you decided, as Justice Weck pointed out, that one night you're not going to um, have your members pay. You're just going to have your members come in, and you're just going to give them booze. Um, this section would apply. That's not, yeah. It, it, I don't think that's going to fly, Your Honor. I don't think this court would ever allow that speakeasy, open saloon, whatever you want to call it, that for one night it allows its customers to come in and drink for free tonight. Right. That's giving. That, yeah, that's giving. I, 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 I don't think you're going to allow that, and I don't think the legislature intended to allow that. The question is, is, is um, I think the language that um, either Justice Palmer or Justice Mandarino used in, in um, I guess in Manning somewhere, that, that the legislature was trying to capture folks in the, in the liquor business, sure. right? In that business. I, 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 agree, I agree, Your Honor. But in Justice, Brobston, or Justice Brobston's example, we're, we're talking about essentially a commercial entity that is engaged in the business of alcohol. If it's, a, if it's an open saloon or a speakeasy, you're engaged in the business of alcohol. That, that is the distinction I, I want to make sure we draw. And, and just so we're clear, the Dairy Farmers Association is not engaged in the business of alcohol. <laughs> no, Your Honor. And, and Justice Todd is correct. We engage in the sale of milk and other dairy products. And it, that's pled in the complaint. It, 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 it like pre, it, it's in there. We used to have those United Dairy Farms stores because I used to go to one after Little League, but I don't think you sold booze in them. Not, not that. Now nowadays, may, you might be able to. Nowadays, you probably could, Your Honor. Nowadays, you probably could. Thank you very much. It's been an honor. A, a lunch recess and uh, we will be back on the bench at 
Good afternoon. Did, would you call the next case, Mr. Minner? In this direct appeal, we address whether the Commonwealth Court properly enjoined PennDOT from commencing administrative debarment proceedings against a contractor which pled no contest to four counts of theft. Good afternoon, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Thomas Howell. I represent the Commonwealth Pennsylvania Department of Transportation in this matter. I'm accompanied here today by my co-counsel, Mr. Jason Wolgamuth. Your Honors, this case presents a very simple question at its core. That is, whether the Commonwealth Court properly prevented an agency from even inquiring into the alleged misconduct of a regulated entity merely because that entity feared the outcome of that particular piece of litigation. The answer to that question is unequivocally no. The Commonwealth Court could not properly enjoin that action, and its holding should therefore be reversed. Indeed, the Commonwealth Court here improperly foreclosed the well-established administrative processes available to PennDOT. That is, the court disregarded the well-reasoned requirement that parties before administrative tribunals must exhaust their administrative remedies before seeking action from the unified judicial system. The exceptions to those exhaustion requirements do not apply here. PennDOT unquestionably has jurisdiction under its own regulations to take conduct that it itself regulates. There is no acute constitutional challenge presented. Rather, the most uh, prescient or, or most pressing constitutional issue is uh, one that is merely supposed by petitioners that could result if they think that PennDOT engages in the very administrative processes that they challenge in a way that they do not like. There is no inadequacy to the administrative remedy here. All of the issues that Habaker seeks to present, and indeed has tried to present to Commonwealth Court, can and should be pursued, pursued in the administrative arena. Well, they, 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 first of all, let me step back. The question before us is whether the Commonwealth Court had any apparently reasonable grounds for enjoining, not whether it was proper or not. So let's right. make sure we got the right standard. Um, but didn't PennDOT's counsel, and it may have been you or Mr. Wogelmuth, I don't know who it was, basically admit in open court that this is a fait accompli, that, that they are going to be debarred, that Paul Baker is going to be debarred? No, I don't believe that to be correct. Instead, what was discussed in open court was the idea that the um, conviction was established a as a matter of law. The actual remedy to be imposed via the process of uh, litigating that debarment by order to show cause um, remains at issue and, and is wholly unresolved. In fact, that's exactly the process that Habaker should avail itself of here. But didn't you didn't you argue that the only evidence that is relevant for purposes of the debarment is the NOLO and that that everything else that Habaker wants to raise is irrelevant and the issues they're raising in the Commonwealth Court are not issues that we're going to be able to decide, such as your um, such as the conflict or alleged conflict between what the Railing Wage Act provides with regard to debarment and your effort to debar. All those issues are issues that they can't get remedies for in, in the before PennDOT. All those issues are actually issues which they can litigate before PennDOT no, because I, I didn't hold on. I didn't say litigate. I said get a remedy. It and has they, to be an administrative remedy, which means you know you can allow them to raise whatever they want. The question is whether they can get a remedy if they're successful on that issue. And the remedy is ultimately prevailing in defense of the order to show cause. That's the purpose of the order to show cause. In fact, the remedy is what may ultimately um, render this entire proceeding moot. They may in fact win. They do not know that they're How going they to win? lose. Excuse me? How do they win? Uh, the hearing officer may decide that in fact under the circumstances shown and any evidence presented by Habaker that debarment is simply not appropriate. Well, I, doesn't your regulation say uh, commission of theft and then it later says proof of a NOLO is proof of conviction of a theft, commission of a theft? It says that commission of the theft is defined by either a finding of guilt or a NOLO plea. Right. So, so, that so if, if, you're, so if, if the agency proves, puts the NOLO plea in front, of, in front of the hearing officer, you're saying the hearing officer has discretion under the regulation to still find that there was no commission of theft? The hearing officer has discretion as to the 
imposition of the penalty, and that need not necessarily well, not a, be debarment. It need not necessarily be three years of debarment. I'm not sure that's a remedy. I'm not sure fighting over what your penalty is uh, is a remedy to your legal challenge. But the legal challenge is, in essence, and in fact, all of the legal challenges or, or the significant majority of legal challenges that Habaker has presented to Commonwealth Court were, in fact, akin to affirmative defenses. These are not um, prospective forward-looking challenges uh, to PennDOT's action. These are rationales or reasons that Habaker wishes to assert um, either provide a defense for or somehow mitigate the, the uh, facts set forth and the um, legal conclusions set forth in the order to show the cause. Only fact, the only fact in the order to show cause is the NOLO plea because, because you tried to do the facts earlier um, through a notice of suspension immediate and the Commonwealth Court enjoined you from pursuing that. Then when they pled NOLO, you tried to do it again, even though there was a preliminary injunction, you did it again. Uh, I'm not saying you violated the PI, the Commonwealth Court didn't say you violated the PI, but you still again pursued debarment this time by an order to show cause, and the order to show cause is based on the NOLO plea. That's correct, and that and is in essence the prima facie evidence that PennDOT goes forward with to demonstrate its case and I, to call. I, I understand. I guess what I'm getting to though is the Commonwealth Court has said, I may disagree with them by the way, but that's not the standard of review. The Commonwealth Court has said there is a constitutional problem with your regulation and that your regulation says on one hand conviction of theft, but on the other hand a NOLO plea is evidence of commission of theft. That's their first issue. Another issue they raise is PennDOT's trying to debar us for something that the General Assembly has said is only debarable by the Department of Labor upon a finding of an intentional violation. And there's a conflict that has to be reconciled. And I think the third thing that still survives as a result of the POs is something about a Line S issue, which I haven't really paid a lot of attention to. But, but why, how can, how can PennDOT, one, in the context of this case, rule on the, on the constitutionality of the NOLO serving as evidence of conviction rule on the conflict between the prevailing wage act provisions on debarment and what the PennDOT is trying to do. And again, I'm not, I haven't really focused on the line S issue. Because those challenges are, are in fact um, artifice in a certain extent. For example, uh, the issue of whether a no low plea is uh, constitutionally infirm um, has already been decided by this court. Eisenberg II addressed almost precisely the same situation. In Eisenberg II, a dentist was litigating a disciplinary case before the BPOA and the, um, I, I believe it was the dentistry board. Um, in that case, after the board had concluded, the dentist pled no low. Um, the board in that case initially didn't give the dentist the opportunity to put in any mitigating evidence as to the charges. Um, it worked its way through the courts, came back up here. This court observed that in fact, the no low plea in an administrative licensing regulated entity scenario is in fact evidence of a conviction of that crime and can be used and that the obligation on the regulator, on in that case the licensing board here, PennDOT and the hearing officer is to allow that regulated entity to come to the table and present evidence, present mitigating evidence, present something that somehow perhaps disabuses PennDOT of their understanding of the facts of the matter. Yeah, but the key, the key in Eisenberg that's different than the regulation here is the Eisenberg regulation said conviction of a crime. And a NOLO plea is often considered a conviction of the crime. The regulation here doesn't say conviction. The regulation here says commission, that you committed a crime. So we, Eisenberg isn't necessarily on all fours. And that's the argument that Hawbaker wants to raise in front of the Commonwealth Court, which is, um, the regulation requires commission, and there's been no adjudication in the NOLO that we actually committed it. In fact, we didn't admit to committing anything, we just admitted to be penalized. First of all, commission is defined in that regulation as conviction by NOLO plea. So while the language is, is the not... <laughs> Which is the problem. Which is the problem. problem Hawbaker's raised. It, that's the problem they're raising, but first of all, that does not obviate the necessity of the administrative proceedings at their inception. Indeed, Hawbaker has the opportunity to raise and preserve all of these issues. Secondly, with respect to the idea that somehow because the theft here implicates other laws, 
um, Paul Baker ought to be immunized from debarment for those um, convictions of theft is completely belied by even a basic interpretation of what theft means. In fact, if, in, if Ha Baker had pled guilty to stealing candy from a baby, if Ha Baker had pled NOLO to stealing um, uh, securities in a white collar crime scheme, no one would be here saying that they are immune from repercussions. So too should no one be saying here that they are immune from repercussions for their theft that appears by Hawbaker's assessment at least to be related to the prevailing wage laws. It doesn't matter who they stole from or why they stole. Instead, it's conviction for the crime of theft, which is what appears on the record here. And it was improper and in fact, wholly improper. It was an abuse of discretion indeed for Commonwealth Court to foreclose PennDOT from even making that inquiry. And that's really what PennDOT seeks to do here. PennDOT seeks to make an inquiry of Hawbaker, please, Come to the table, Glenn O'Hawbaker, Inc., and tell us. Tell us why we have this wrong. Tell us why something about our analysis may be incorrect. We are here to listen and to determine what the appropriate remedy, if any, is in this circumstance. In fact, it's clear from the record established below that yet other rationale for imposing an injunction have not been met. Instead, uh, for example, one of the primary requisites for granting an injunction is that greater injury result from refusing the injunction. Well, here, greater injury clearly results from the injunction. Indeed, this injunction prevents PennDOT from engaging in the process to ensure that its contractors are responsible. This injunction prevents PennDOT from engaging in the process to ensure that other bidders come to the table on equal footing with Glenn Hawbaker. This process prevents this injunction prevents PennDOT from engaging in the process of ensuring that its citizens and its taxpayers are provided the best benefit from responsible, um, non-criminal actor bidders and contractors. The injunction here frustrates all of that, and it was, in fact, clearly erroneous. Counsel, could I ask you, does this um, Commonwealth Court Ruling in the meantime, overruling most of the POs affect this case in any way? Those, uh, the Commonwealth Court ruling on, uh, I believe, three of the POs, in essence, takes those issues off the table. Um, some of the defenses raised by Hawbaker, indeed, in their brief to this court, involve things like the defense of latches. Um, those are, are no longer relevant to this dispute. Commonwealth Court has determined that, in fact, um, those defenses are. Are, are not cognizable. So in essence, it, it has whittled down the, uh, really, the number of issues both before this court and the Commonwealth Court. What other issues are obviated in your view? Uh, I believe that the Commonwealth Court's opinion um, addressed latches, uh, preserved, and I'm sorry, I don't have uh, complete command of that more recent opinion. Um, I believe it preserved a Lyness issue, and it preserved the two issues that Justice Robson mentioned earlier with respect to the um, uh, prevailing wage um, jurisdiction and with respect to the effect of a no-low plea. Um, the, the, the other issues have been resolved in favor of the Department by Commonwealth Court. Maybe this is a question best asked uh, to your opposing counsel, but um, what does the labor and industry potential jurisdiction have to do with this since he was already prosecuted by the attorney general? General, Under that theory, the AG couldn't prosecute either. Well, exactly, Your Honor. I think that's, if, if Ha Baker was of that mind, I don't know why that wasn't raised before uh, pleading NOLO. If, if in fact, um, anything that touches upon wages can't be addressed by other, any other entity, if, if that theory is correct, then no one would have been able to pursue this, whether it be the Attorney General, PennDOT, DGS. In fact, it's, it's actually a misreading of the Prevailing Wage Act because, well, L&I does investigate um, prevailing wage violations. Um, there's nothing that commits the ultimate issue of debarment to labor and industry. Um, DGS undertakes debarments all the time. It's one of the Department of General Services' roles in ensuring the integrity of contractors. Well, hold up. But Right, but not necessarily. DGS doesn't do it for prevailing wage act violations. 
they do if LNI has found that prevailing wage is violated. Intentionally. Um, the, the, the debarment is specifically spoken of in the Prevailing Wage Act. It's, there's, the General Assembly expressly spoke of it, sure. and they said for an intentional violation of the Prevailing Wage Act, you can be debarred. It doesn't say for any other way, and couldn't at least, again, a question that I think <laughs> they're, they're, the Hawbaker is trying to get resolved here before it goes through the process of an administrative proceeding that it can't get the answer to this question from is if the General Assembly and the Prevailing Wage Act has said you can only be debarred for an intentional violation of the Prevailing Wage Act, can they be debarred for any other type of alleged violation of the Prevailing Wage Act in the absence of an adjudication of intent? That's the question they're trying to get resolved by the Commonwealth Court. And again, I don't know if I would have done the same thing. Maybe I would have gone through the administrative proceeding and, and then raised the, all these issues up on appeal. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the issues that the Commonwealth Court has flagged in its subsequent opinion in light of the first one are issues that they can get a remedy on in the administrative agency. And I'm gonna go back and le read what counsel for PennDOT said at the hearing about this, but my understanding of it was basically, it was, a, and I think the Commonwealth Court found as fact to this effect that the hearing is gonna be a fait accompli and there's really no point in going there because we're gonna be back here anyway to resolve these very legal issues that PennDOT won't be able to decide. Sure, they'll be able to create make their arguments, but PennDOT's not going to decide these issues because they can't. The PennDOT certainly can decide what the penalty, if any, is. I mean, the, the hearing officer can dismiss that. And going back to the intentional violation, that is Hawbaker bringing the case that they wish PennDOT had brought. This is not a prevailing wage case. This is a case based on theft. And PennDOT's entitled to call Hawbaker to the table via the order to show cause to inquire into that theft. PennDOT has not brought a debarment action based on prevailing wage. I see, I, I, and again, I'm gonna stop because I, I, I'm, I'm probably spending too much time here, but as I read the record that the Commonwealth Court decided this preliminary injunction on, which is what we are looking at, um, the Commonwealth Court found that you are not calling in Haw Baker to answer for the theft and things like that, you're calling in Hot Baker to lay down the NOLO and say, you're debarred. That's what you're calling Hot Baker in for. At least that's how I read what the Commonwealth Court found based on the record, which I think we have to give deference to. And I think, Your Honor, you just said it yourself, based on, on the NOLO, on the conviction for theft, which is in fact what is set forth in the order, order to show cause, not the violation intentional or unintentional of prevailing wage law, which is what Hawbaker has been spending time here arguing about. Rather, this is about the NOLO plea, and it's to ask Hawbaker, again, to come to the forum to demonstrate why perhaps it should not be debarred. Yes, PennDOT may not need to do more than put the NOLO plea on the table. That is a fact. That is what the regulations say. Of course, it behooves any litigator to put more evidence on the table, but they need not do that to establish the prima facie case to issue the order to show cause, which is what they did here. And I, I just want to touch on one more thing. You know, one of the standards, again, is the public interest in issuing an injunction. And in this particular case, it's clear that the issuance of the injunction, rather than its absence, is what harms the public interest. In fact, enjoining PennDOT's action here places the interests of a single contractor, its pecuniary interests, places that above the interests, not just of, of PennDOT, who has to manage the system, but of every other participant in that system, of every other user of PennDOT's highways, of every other taxpayer who helps fund those highways. It was clear error for the Commonwealth Court here to issue that injunction, and for that reason, PennDOT requests that the opinion and order of the Commonwealth Court be overturned and that injunction lifted. Thank you, Mr. Howell. Thank you. Well done. Let's hear from Mr. Kutz. Good afternoon, Your Honors. If it pleases the Court, my name is James Kutz. Uh, my co-counsel, Sarah Heiser-Staub. Uh, together, we represent the appellee in this matter, Glenn O'Hawbaker, Inc. Um, I was going to start with the standard, but Judge Joseph Robson has already articulated that. And in the briefing the PennDOT submitted, they don't even attempt to raise the issue of palpably erroneous or the things that, the deference that must be shown to Commonwealth Court's opinion. And I don't, respectfully, I don't think they met that standard here. 
with regard to Justice Robson's question about the record, I was trial counsel to Hall Baker uh, counsel here who did not attend the new trial. That was Mr. Wolgamuth and Mr. Davis, and essentially they did admit on the record that, yes, the NOLO plea would be the only thing that would be relied upon. That would be their case, and it would be their understanding would be fate outcome plea in terms of would they be debarred. Now, the length of debarment was not understood. That could be a theoretically a lesser time, but that was part of the Commonwealth Court record. Let me start with counsel. Let me let me just follow up on that. There's sure. a difference. It, it, their prima facie case may in fact be based upon the uh, no low plea, the con the conviction that goes on the record as a result of it. That's different than predicting what a hearing officer is going to do after hearing the defenses. Well. Respectfully, Your Honor, we, we didn't predict what the hearing officer was going to no, do. I'm, I'm suge but you're suggesting that they predicted on the record what a hearing they, officer they was going to do. But, but, but so what? That's uh, fluff. Well, they, they stated what their case was going to be <laughs> there, in terms, they, in so terms of the NOLO that? plea. What's wrong with that? Why well, can't that be their case? They can bring a disbarment uh, proceeding based upon a conviction. Under the PennDOT regulations, the they can use the NOLO plea, which we believe is unconstitutional, uh, based on the criminal conviction. But there's a big difference between a NOLO plea and a guilty plea. I, the I, rules I, of evidence don't allow them to use a NOLO plea as evidence of commission of the underlying offense. PA rule of, of 410 precludes that. They can't use it. The plea agreement that was signed here and the plea colloquy precludes the use of that evidence in a future civil proceeding. And that's what PennDOT was, and that was why we did what we did, which that was, was trying to seek relief from the court. Uh, and the primary purpose of that was we believe it belongs at the Department of Labor and Industry where mens re is a critical part of it. I understand that. I, and, and, you know, I understand your view. I understand that we're looking for palpable error. I'm just trying to understand how it's palpable error to say that a conviction is evidence of a commission of a crime. Well, it's the department that we need to show the palpable uh, error. Well, you're but, here but, now. Uh, uh, <laughs> fair, fair enough. But, but the, the conviction, if you will, is only evidence that a, there was a criminal conviction. The case law is clear in PA Rule 4 evidence. Is clear. If it's a NOLO plea, if it's a conviction based on a NOLO plea, it can't be used to show the evidence of commission. And that's what their regulations say. It's also what Section 531 of the Procurement Code says. And curiously, Section 531 of the Procurement Code, which was passed later in time, it's the General Assembly statement of when you can debar a contractor, is different than PennDOT's pre-qualification regulations. Pre-qualification regulations were drafted by the Department. In the General Assembly, when they came out and drafted 531 in 1998, they didn't mention a NOLO plea that could be used. There's no mention that you can use a NOLO plea to commission. NOLO it says pleas, you must show the commission. NOLO pleas can't be used to show the underlying fact. Of a conviction, okay. yes. And you're saying that that means that you can't use the conviction of record, which is what results from a NOLO plea, to establish that a crime was committed. That's what, about the underlying fact. That's what the Pennsylvania Rules of Evidence state. No, they don't. The Pennsylvania Rules of Evidence state that you can't use the NOLO plea to establish the underlying facts of the con conviction. Correct? But I'd have to look at the exact rule, and maybe I misheard your first question. My understanding of Pennsylvania Rule of Evidence 410 is that evidence of the NOLO plea cannot be used in a civil proceeding and then there's a comment that said it might be able to be used for a purpose such as impeachment, for example. But to show the underlying alleged commission of the act, facts, it can't be used. The facts, the underlying facts. Correct. Correct. Which, and I'm just asking you, do, in, in your view, that means you can't establish that a crime was committed. No, it the can't The conviction be. is not evidence that a crime was committed. But, uh, I'm sorry, maybe, maybe I'm mishearing your a, question. A conviction of record cannot be used as evidence that a crime was committed. In the future administrative or civil proceeding? Yes. What does is, what is Eisenberg stand for? Eisenberg was brought against, it was a penal statute, 
Uh, it was brought against uh, a dent was yeah. it dentist, I believe. Um, I was get state dental in Eisenberg. Maybe this was a different, maybe an osteopathic doctor um, for mail fraud. And they did address the NOLO plea there, but it was a distinctly different situation than what we have here. Here we have a debarment statute that was drafted by PennDOT that says you must show commission of the crime. It's a completely different regulatory scheme than it was issued at Eisenberg. So that's different, difference number one. PennDOT must show the commission. Difference number two is the law is clear that in order, that debarment is a concept that has been, has been litigated at both the state and federal level. And in order for the debarment to be valid, it must be remedial, not penal. And if it's penal, there's case law that suggests that that's too punitive and therefore not enforceable. In the case of here, we have a debarment statute. It's completely so it's a, it's a remedial statute as opposed to a penal statute, which is what exists in Eisenberg. The third difference here is we had a plea, a plea agreement and a plea colloquy, two different things. The plea agreement set forth a corporate monitor, among other things. So if the concern that counsel has raised or PennDOT has raised is there's going to be some issue here. Paul Baker is, is paying for a corporate monitor to come in and ensure prevailing wage compliance for the next five years or five years from the is date of the that a strong defense to raise yes. at the administrative proceeding? There's no harm here. I'm being monitored on a daily basis. Is, isn't that the point that PennDOT is making? You, you come forward with that defense oh. and, you know, the outcome may be right. I mean... Uh, the, the company's being monitored. We, I, uh, the, the integrity of our contractor is not at issue here because our mm -hmm. contractor is being monitored pursuant to this agreement. And that's why there's no harm to the department. Absolutely. In terms no, of... That wasn't my, that wasn't my well, point. Isn't it a defense? Well, it's, it would certainly, if a, if a debarment hearing at the administrative level go forward, it would be one of the defenses. But your question was, what's the no, difference between... No, I asked, no, my question was, is that not a valid defense that may result in no debarment? In, in the case of the PennDOT and the debarment hearing they want to have? Correct. Not the way they've represented it. Now, in the case that we, that in a defense, in a, in a fair hearing, uh, that would certainly be one defense in mitigating circumstances that may impact the duration of debarment. But here we have a specific statutory scheme that requires this matter to be before labor and industry. And the reason why that's important to Hallbaker, the reason why it's important for why Commonwealth Court consider is the concept of mens re. Hallbaker introduced testimony at the hearing that's within the petition for review that the system that he put in place, which has to do with the credit for fringe benefits. And this isn't they paid wages too low. There's a complex calculation that only consultants understand that has to be done with how much you credit. Paul Baker had advice of counsel to do that. They, for 20 years, got more than 20 years, got that approved by Department of Labor and Industry, by Department of Labor at the federal level. And in 2018, someone came along with a different interpretation. So why we want to be before Department of Labor and Industry is not because we have some uh, non-affinity for PennDOT. We work with PennDOT every day. They're our biggest client. It is the standard of mens re that the General Assembly said that in case of prevailing wage act violations, two things occur. Number one, you've got to show intent or there is no debarment. And number two, you have to give them, if there's no intent, the opportunity to pay back whatever L&I says you need to pay back. Okay. And that happens all the time. And I understand the facts. The, the conviction of record was for a crime that requires intent. Doesn't that cover this issue to the extent that uh, you're tied to this notion that this has to be brought by L&I? And, and let, me, uh, let me tie to that. How does the AG prosecute this crime under your theory? That's a good question. Well, and it's it's except, one that's really not before this court. Done, except it's done. There's a, a no-low plea and there's a conviction of record. Well, how, how they processed it, it, what it I mean, L&I should have been the first, in, in fact, our belief is that it was referred to L&I, and, and then we don't know what happened from there. But the state doesn't have a wage theft statute, but, but, but the again, AG, those issues aren't before the court. The AG prosecuted this case. Yes, they did. And there is a conviction of record resulting from that prosecution. And the conviction of record is for a crime that required intent. And that's why I'm, I'm, 
uh, it, it seems like a circuitous uh, uh, argument that we're involved with here, assuming even for the sake of discussion that uh, uh, the, you know, the uh, L&I rules and regulations have anything to do with what PennDOT is going to be doing. Well, the whole premise behind a NOLO plea, because it would not have been a, we don't believe there would have been a finding of guilt or, and there wouldn't have been a guilty plea. The reason you have the access to a NOLO plea is to avoid that kind of consequence that someone can draw a conclusion. Yeah, but the, pro properly. the problem is, Mr. Kutz, um, the regulation was extant when your client pled uh, NOLO. And, and Which, NOLO, the, the PennDOT regulation okay, with the NOLO plea would operate. And, and when your client pled NOLO, your client is presumed to know that regardless of the fine arguments you're making about the rules of evidence, that there's a PennDOT regulation that says NOLO pleas are going to be used to prove the commission of the crime. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of arguments that, you know, your client could have made in response to the criminal conviction. Um, by taking the NOLO, your client really did put themselves in this box, in this problem. There were absolutely a lot of arguments that could have been made. I wasn't criminal counsel, but there were a lot of arguments. One of them could made. be whether the Prevailing Wage Act a violation even provides for criminal penalties, because I'm not sure that it does. I'm not sure there's anything in the Prevailing Wage Act that showed the General Assembly intended a violation to be a crime. I, I would agree with that. But again, not, that's not before the court. Um, but in terms of the knowledge of the regulation, they also had knowledge of some other things, one of which is the terms of the plea itself, one of which is the plea colloquy that says you're not going to be punished. Now, again, if, in the context of that, knowing the existence of the regulation takes on a different tenor, that you believe that in the context of a corporate monitor, why would the OAG require a corporate monitor if you're going to be debarred for the next well, Did you argue, is, was your Latch's argument, was your Latch's argument that the, that the Commonwealth, here PennDOT, um, is somehow stopped because the Commonwealth entered a binding plea colloquy that said no further penalties were going to be. That was not the Latches argument. The Latches argument was. Maybe based you should have made that argument, though. Well, I don't. I mean, I think that's a different. There's argument. only one Commonwealth. There's it's, one Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It's an estoppel argument. I'm not sure it's a Latches argument because okay. there's not time. Okay. There's two components to the Latches argument. There's the reliance argument, and then there's a the time argument. The Latches argument had to do with reliance on the advice of L and I and DOL. But you didn't raise decades. an estoppel argument either. We raised uh, the argument that the plea colloquy stopped the contractor from, or stopped the department from raising these issues. Do any other justices have questions for Mr. Kutz? Well done, thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. In this case, father challenged the amount of child support he was ordered to pay towards child, towards child care expenses for his daughter. Specifically, father argued that he should not be required to reimburse mother for child care expenses that were not actually paid as mother was on voluntary unpaid sabbatical from her teaching job during the relevant period. The trial court dismissed father's challenge and the superior court affirmed. We granted review to determine whether the lower courts erred in this regard. Good afternoon. Uh, may it please the court. Thank you, Chief Justice and the rest of the justices for this opportunity. Uh, this is the first time that I've been able to do this. And I uh, thank you very much, not just for that opportunity, but for agreeing to hear this matter because I realized yesterday in preparing this case for today how the Superior Court got it wrong, how the trial court got it wrong, and how Mr. Wirtz and I have been arguing this case for three years obliquely. Um, <clears throat> as to the way that we approached it, and we approached it the way that Judge Bowe and the Superior Court approved of. 
we approached it as the hearing officer ordered Mr. Fiacetta to pay childcare fees that were not actually incurred by the mother. And I do apologize for the court because as pointed out by counsel, I guess there's a few times that I quoted that as being the language in the rule when the rule says paid. And I interpreted paid as actually incurred and at times when quoting the rule, put in the, inadvertently put in the wrong language. Um, <clears throat> the only case that I found that really deals with the issue of whether or not they are to be paid is the Portugal case. And that case says that because the amounts were not being paid, in that case, a father said, look, you told me this is how much I have to pay for my kid's childcare. I have two children. One of them is gonna be aging out into regular school. And so you should automatically reduce it by the amount that it's gonna be reduced. And the trial court and later the superior court said, no, that's not the way you do it. When the amount changes, then you come back because the rule 1910.16-6 says reasonable child care expenses paid. So you need to know the amount that's being paid and it needs to actually be paid. Now, Judge Bowes, in her opinion, added in a footnote, I am cognizant of the equitable dilemma regarding the imposition of a full-time earning capacity on mother while depriving her of reimbursement for child care expenses that she would have incurred while working full-time during the COVID-19 pandemic. And she goes on to explain about what I just recited about the uh, availability of reimbursement only for amounts paid. But that problem is the same problem addressed by the child court, excuse me, by the trial court and by the superior court that we're giving mother a full-time wage, or excuse me, a full-time earning capacity but we're not doing anything with, if she were earning this fictional money, the child care that she would have to pay. Counsel, that's where, the, that's where it has to be adjusted, isn't it? Can I just cut to the chase here? As, as I understand how this is supposed to work and Morgan v. Morgan actually discusses this issue. The imputed income needs to be adjusted by the imputed costs that would have been incurred for childcare in order to earn that imputed income. If I may use the word bingo, that is what <laughs> I, I realized you were yesterday. Get to this. <laughs> but isn't the isn't the if I could follow up on that? Isn't the point that where the the court below got it wrong is doing this under sixteen six? They could have done it and should have done it under sixteen two. Yes. Right. What. So, Isn't that the point? Yes, and, yeah. the, and the point is, so who cares why they did it? Well, it made a big difference to these parties where they did it. So under 16.2, as was, and I, I picked this up from the opposing counsel's brief, it is supposed to be adjusted, and as Your Honor said in Morgan, it's supposed to be adjusted when you're calculating the net income of the party who is having the imputed income. That's where it's supposed to be subtracted. And not the end. Correct. Correct. Yes. The question I have, sorry, yes, sir. is why shouldn't we just remand this back so the new rule can be applied? Because my understanding is the old rule was applied at the hearing office, the trial stage, and Superior Court issued its decision prior to, I mean, the, the rural committee changed the rule prior to the Superior Court and the new rule, I believe we, the Superior Court applied the old rule. Judge Bowes said, let's apply the new rule. Why don't we just remand it back? I'm not aware of any difference in the rules and that might be my failing. My under the rules change from the use of 
when it, particularly when we're talking about voluntary reduction of income with earning capacity where it used to be assume and reduce or assume and have the intent to assume or. The way I see this is that any time you, uh, there's a voluntary reduction of employment and earning capacity is not imputed, there is no downward movement in support. However, the moment the court imposes an earning capacity, then we must and shall consider childcare expense. So the question becomes one of if the court imputed an earning capacity, then pursuant to the rule as written, it shall consider, not has, it doesn't have to be applied, but it shall consider that. And it's at the judge's discretion whether it's applied. The question, secondarily to that, is when is it reduced, from the net, or, you, or do you reduce it after the uh, recommendation is provided by the hearing officer and separate and apart of an earning? Well, I guess, I, I'm not sure if this is really gonna answer your question, but I do believe that the solution is I believe that the ideal solution would be to remand it to have the facts applied to the law correctly. The problem that I see is that what we're doing is we're saying that the trial court needed to consider these expenses and if they thought these expenses were important then to use that to perhaps reduce the mother's imputed income. However, while, that it, while a similar issue was raised with the trial court, the appellee did not bring that issue on appeal. So I don't know if there is any authority to change her income. Well, sure, I mean, we, can, we send it back and we tell the trial court to handle this as a 16-2 case, which is what it should have been. It may end up in a higher higher, higher payment, may end up in a lower payment, but that's the, the, the problem here. It, 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 this could be an academic mistake, but we don't know that. We don't know on remand when the hearing officer and the trial court apply 16-2, whether it's gonna come out exactly the same or come out higher or lower, but that's why we have trial courts. The point here, I thought, um, especially after you sort of made your oral amendment to your argument, uh, is that you recognize, um, and I guess Mr. Burtz insists otherwise, we'll hear him, uh, that this is somehow, it has to be a 16-6 case. I don't see why it would be a 16-6 case rather than a 16-2 case, and I don't see anybody why anybody would object to that. And counsel, it's been a 16-2 case for years because it was a 16-2 case at the time Morgan v. Morgan was decided. That's not a that's not a new rule. And I'm not I'm not arguing that it is, Your Honor. And why wouldn't this just be a reverse and remand? I don't I don't understand the complication involved here. I'm not arguing against it being a reverse and a remand my response to the question of whether that would be done is that we're only focusing on the 16D question, but the, the, the way we get over the moral dilemma that basically what I see the superior court justices and the trial court doing is saying, we don't like the idea that we're assessing her and an imputed income and we're ignoring the reason why she's doing the imputed income. And the way that the rule gets into that is the 16-2, is saying you adjust it over here. Yeah, there's no moral dilemma. I mean, it, 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 it's, the rules are set up precisely to accommodate the situation. When you're imputing income, you also impute reasonable childcare expenses that would have been incurred in order to make the imputed income. Where's the moral dilemma? Well, there is, I think I see the moral dilemma. I'm just not sure. I, I mean, I think the, the point is you seem to be winning. And, and I'm not sure why you're still talking. Um, and, and so 
but but let me pivot for a second because I think your client your client's point is just simple. Your client doesn't want to have to pay an expense that was never incurred. Yes, sir. Okay, that's that's your case in a nutshell, and it seems to be a pretty good point because even if you impute even even the imputing of income <clears throat> to to uh, the spouse here um, or the estranged spouse does not require your client to actually pay it. Um, so, so the reason why you're here is you are, for, you are being forced to pay something that has never been incurred. Um, what I'm trying to understand is, and I can buy all that, that's something I can wrap my central Pennsylvania brain around. Um, what I'm trying to understand is when does 6A1 Romanet 2 come into play? Um, because that clearly is a situation where 16.2 has already been applied because in earnings has been imputed. Um, you know, and it says may allocate reasonable child care expenses paid by the parties when the trier of fact imputes an earning capacity under two. So if everything is taken care of, as Justice Donahue said in two, when would six be triggered in an imputed earnings situation? How about this? Council, how about if the uh, non-custodial parent uh, is incurring uh, child care expenses on during the times in which he or she has the child? I think that's an six excellent would, example, Six Your would Honor. kick in, and the court could then award reasonable child care uh, expenses actually paid. I think that is the distinction, Your Honor. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Foster? Before you sit down, sir, I would like to know what the moral dilemma is. My, my understanding of the Superior Court and Judge Regan, I think the term actually used was equitable. And my understanding is one reason why we use equity is to fix to something that fair. could be a moral dilemma, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Let's You're welcome, from thank Mr. you. Bruce. May it please the court. My name is Brian Burtz. My law firm, Pollock Begg, represents the eighth grade teacher who is the appellee in this case, Megan Miker. I'd like to begin with a point that Justice Wecht made and then move to the points that Justice Donahue and, and Doherty made uh, in this case. Um, the first point being that this indeed is a 1910.16-2 case, which must be read in pari materia with Rule 1910.16-6. I'm going to refer to them um, in my argument as the earning capacity rule, 1910.16-2, and the child care rule, 1910.16-6. Justice Wecht mentioned, we have to take these things in sequence. The first thing that has to be determined in a child support case under the income shares model, which has been the law of this commonwealth for decades now, is we have to determine earning capacity. The income shares model is a statistical database that attempts to uh, through survey data determine the average expenditures in the household of an intact family. It was promulgated in order to promote the goals of efficiency and uniformity and it dispensed with the prior law where we examined the actual expenses in a particular case. A family where one of the parents is living rent-free with, with their family members receives the same amount of child support as a parent who has to pay rent or mortgage expenses. And so uniformity and consistency and efficiency are the principal goals of the income shares model. Now, um, the, the, the and, and so these two rules have to be taken in order. First, the income has to be determined. Under the income shares model, there is no provision for deducting childcare expenses under any circumstances. There are only 
three permissible deductions from gross income. They are taxes in all their different flavors, uh, union dues in those cases, and mandatory retirement contributions, generally in the case of municipal and government workers. Child care expenses are not permissible deductions from income, so it would be impractical. In fact, it would be completely inconsistent with the income shares model for us in earning capacity cases to do what we do not do in any routine income child support cases. Um, <clears throat> after the, the incomes of the parties have been determined, then the child care rule kicks in and it provides that these expenses will be allocated proportionally. If a father earns 2,000 a month and a mother earns 1,000 per month, then the guideline determines how much child support is paid for a family with 3,000 of combined income. And then the child care expenses are allocated two-thirds, one-third. Now, the income shares model is um, elaborated and explained to this court periodically in reports made to the Domestic Relations Rules Committee by Dr. Jane Venor from uh, a, a think tank in the Midwest who does this for state legislatures all over the country. And in her reports, the most recent two are from 2021, which triggered this change in the rules, and before that, 2016, she indicates that child care expenses are clearly child rearing expenses. However, they're so variable from case to case, from uh, toddlers to teenagers, that they are not included in the statistical model that determines the base child support amount. Instead, the only practical way to handle child care expenses is through an add on, which is also how we handle health care and certain other kinds of expenses. So for the sake of uh, uh, the moral dilemma in, in my view is the statutory mandate to treat similarly situated families in similar fashion. It's the reason why every family that has a combined income of $3,000 per month has the same child support amount, regardless of what their actual expenses are. And earning capacity is quite frequently a necessary expense for a working parent to be able to fulfill an earning capacity. And in this case, there was a very clear history. Mother was a working teacher who took a year off because of the COVID pandemic and her health concerns. She took a sabbatical for a year. She was held to the same earning capacity. It would be impossible for her to fulfill that earning capacity without having the same child care expenses that she had when she was working the, the prior year or when she worked the year after that. So counsel, I apologize. I don't mean to interrupt you, but her, 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 her amount, was it reduced when she took the sabbatical, did they impute an earning capacity or did they just never, did the judge just never change the initial support obligation? I think the answer to both of those is yes. They, they held her to the same earning capacity, uh, an earning capacity equal to what she earned when she was working full time. It, but that's where the problem I see it is triggered between the, the failure to voluntary reduction versus earning capacity. She was never really imputed an earning capacity. There was just not a downward reduction of her obligation, correct? That, that might be accurate, Your Honor. So are we misguided by giving earning capacity precedence here as opposed to looking at it from a, a, a um, an earning like a 16.24 as opposed to a D2? Not necessarily. There are a couple of different varieties of earning capacity cases. There are cases in which a parent is underemployed, where they have taken 
Uh, I think the classic example off the top of my head is an old case called Kersey versus Jefferson. A gentleman who was planning to go to med school and become a doctor instead took a job when he found out that his girlfriend was pregnant. He took a job as a pharmaceutical sales rep after a couple of years. He wanted to stop working, go back to med school, and he argued that this would, in the long run, uh, maximize his earning capacity, or it would maximize his income, and he was held to the income he had earned as a pharmaceutical sales rep, even though he had scaled back. Um, we have cases where there are parents who have an education that they are not currently using, or work experience that they're not currently utilizing, and, and so there's, a, there's an entire variety of these things. There was a question here about remand, and I'm, I want to address Can this. Can I ask a question before you move on to that? Uh, the uh, imputed income for mother was 5220 per month, correct? Correct. Um, was that uh, akin to what she was actually earning on a monthly basis when she was employed as a teacher? In the prior okay. school year, yeah, that's okay. correct. And when she was employed during that prior school year, did she actually pay uh, child care expenses? She did, okay. and in fact, that was the basis of her testimony at this modification, that if she were to keep working, this is what she had paid in the past and would so, continue So of that 5220, which was imputed to her of income, she would have been paying out of that amount, amount child care expenses. Out of that, plus the child care she was receiving from Mr. Fioketta. Okay, so. You uh, mean the support. The support, I'm sorry. So um, instead of imputing her an income of 5220, it should, the income should have been imputed as 5220 minus whatever child care expenses she would have been paying at the time. I suppose that that could be um, a consideration, but Your Honor, that's inconsistent with the way we do it in routine income cases, and more importantly, it's inconsistent with the income shares model. Okay, but this isn't uh, your ordinary income case. This is an imputed, imputed income case that has its a, a, a different set of rules, so to speak, that be, you're imputing income and then you're imputing the child care expenses that would have been incurred in order to earn that income, which is what she was doing. She was making 52.20 a month, but that's actually not what she had because she was paying some amount of child care expenses. So should not have that 52.20 have been reduced by the reasonable child care expenses that would have been uh, expended uh, had she in fact been working. The income in, in our view should not be reduced. It opens the door to reductions for a whole variety of different expenses. There are parents who could come into court and say the only way that I could achieve this earning capacity is by driving to Washington, D.C. And so you should deduct my compu commuting expense. Yeah, and the rule specifically refers to child care expenses when you're imputing income. I mean, there may be a myriad of other things that somebody could hypothesize would come into play, but the rule actually anticipates this issue of child care expenses that would have been incurred in order to earn the income that's now being imputed. And shouldn't I, that be where it is taken into account as opposed to what happened here, which is imputing her with income of 5220 and then adding on to that child care expenses? I Your mean, Honor, it's, it's backwards. Y Your Honor, if we're talking about the new rule, and by the way, what I want to mention here is that the new rule, which was enacted in August of 2021, days after I filed my brief in that case, it's actually referenced in the dissenting Superior Court judge's opinion. Mm -hmm. So it was within the contemplation of the Superior Court in this case, and I believe that under Rule 70, uh, I'm sorry, 52C, I believe that the new rule would be applied if the court had remanded then or if it remands now. The new rule would apply. Now, to speak to the, the question you just Posed, there is an interplay between the earning capacity rule and the child care rule. 
the child care rule says that in earning capacity cases, the court may allocate. It doesn't say shall deduct. And under the old rule, child care expenses and responsibilities were listed as a factor, a mere factor in determining earning capacity. The child care uh, rule was silent on this issue. Now, in 2021, when the Domestic Relations Rules Committee examined this, and it is confidential, I, I uh, have no inside knowledge of what was going on there, except that it is reported on the Domestic Relations Rules Committee's website that there were, um, well, it, it shows that the original Proposal 180 of, 19, uh, of 2021 proposed a rule that would have said, wait a second, let me find it for you. They proposed a rule that would have said, quote, the trier of fact shall apportion a reasonable child care amount between the parties consistent with rule 1910.16-6A, even though child care expenses are not actually incurred. For whatever reason, a change was made before the final rule was enacted. I believe that there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, we don't want parents trying to get credit for the value of services when a family member provides or when there's subsidized child care. But I think the main reason why this version of the rule was not enacted is because we have always given the courts discretion and that comes back to your point, Your Honor. The, the trial courts have discretion in these matters to determine whether or not the child care allocation fits the particular case. In this case, Judge Regan looked at the fact that the earning capacity would have been impossible for the mother to achieve without child care. And there was history to prove it. Here is my issue. The word imputed is used repeatedly. The question or concern that I have is under a voluntary reduction, there's no need to impute. The obligation remains the same. Therefore, I guess I have the following question. The initial support obligation developed out of the divorce, correct? The initial consent decree, I think, is how they termed it in the briefs. I, and then that may be true, I don't recall. And then father filed a support modification. Correct. And it was then your mother indicated she was on sabbatical. Right. And there was never an earning capacity pursuant to the earning capacity rule that applied. There was just never a downward deviation of the support guidelines. Therefore, the earning capacity rule is removed from this equation completely because there's no imputing of a obligation. It's the existing obligation as a result, which is the basis upon the modification. Am I correct? You may be correct. I don't recall whether or not the child support amount itself remained the same. Her income remained the same. So let's posit a hypothetical here. If if the mother's income remained the same, but there were other factors, the father earned more or less, or the child care guide or the, the child support guidelines changed, mm -hmm. where there is a modification of the amount of support, even though the parents, it's not, as you say, an earning capacity case. She doesn't get relieved of her income imputation. Now, I'm not sure that that's a distinction with difference, but. No. I am assuming that the original support obligation took into consideration the reasonable child care expense. Yes, that is correct. And now in the modification petition, the court remained it as the same and father's saying, hey, we want it reduced because we're not paying child care. But the only way you really consider child care expenses is if it's a imputed earning capacity and not a just a 
judicial finding that this was a voluntary reduction. And I think that the new rules make that very clear. The earning capacity case or the earning capacity rule is explicitly referenced in the child care rule. Right. It's been broken into two pieces and now there, the child care rule has a section. Oh, and I, I don't know if I remembered to mention that I've given you the copies of the actual rules. Okay. Yeah, counsel, uh, you, earlier I asked you a question that I don't know if we're contradicting it here or not. Uh, uh, I was of the opinion or the view based upon our discussion and what I read that mother's imputed income was actually made by the court and it was $5,220 a month. It was ir irrespective of the uh, former support order or anything of that nature. There was an imputed income determined by the court of 5220. That's the issue. Right. It, 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 that's what but that's unanswered. No, it, he's saying it is. That is answered. That's what the court, that was the imputed income that the court uh, assigned yeah. to the mother. They oh. imputed her an earning capacity equal to what she previously Correct. earned. Correct, and he, he did not deduct from that amount reasonable child care expenses right. that would have been incurred in order for her to have that imputed income. Because the rules don't permit the deduction of child care expenses. Well, let me ask you this question, counsel. What rule <coughs> of support um, provides for the non-custodial parent to include in their support obligation a child care expense, that expense that is not paid? The, the rule that permits that, Your Honor, would be um, – if I understood your question, I think it, it would be Rule 1910.16-6, and you're stumbling over the phrase paid by the parties, mm -hmm. which I suggest to the, the court doesn't may— mean what it, Doesn't mean what it says? <laughs> I, I think— I, I, I think— That's why people go to law school. <laughs> I think the fact that at the end of that, that it talks— that it references the earning capacity rule means that— Paid by the parties can be read as would be paid by the well, parties. But, see, but here's your problem with that, and, and I realize this is our rule. I, I, I get that, but we still apply the principles of statutory construction right. to the rules. 16.2 shows that this court and our committees are capable of drafting language of would have incurred or would incur. We, we clearly have that within our lexicon. Yet in 16.6, we didn't use that language. We used something else, and we said paid by the parties. Not that would have been paid by the parties or would have been incurred or that was assigned to the other spouse. We actually say paid by the parties. By the same token, and I know this isn't the greatest argument, it doesn't say actually paid by the parties. It says paid by the parties I, I as provided. I, I generally adopt the view that if you have to add an adverb, <laughs> um, it's it's usually not well <laughs> statutory construction. Let me let me follow up on that. Um, doesn't doesn't the fact that sixteen six um, says paid, coupled with the fact that sixteen six a four demands documentation documentation which in this case does not exist and did not exist, further support the point that. Where the trial court went wrong here is simply by using 16.6 instead of 16.2. I mean, you could still get there using 16.2. Why do you feel compelled to defend the way the trial court approached this rather than just going down on remand and, and, and litigating the 16.2? Because at 16.2, can't the trial court make these adjustments for child care rather than trying to reword the word paid in 16.6. I agree with Your Honor. <laughs> Here's the problem, though. The problem is that 16.2, this earlier one, doesn't say anything about deducting or allocating. And the income, I keep coming back to the income shares model. The income well, but then, shares. But I, I, and it, you're right, but I, I think Justice Donahue expounded upon this. And, and that is a place 
where the court in assigning an earning capacity can take into account what your client's impact from a child care perspective would be in establishing her earning capacity without requiring um, the other parent to pay for a fictional expense. It, it, that, the adjustment can happen with that. The, I, I think the reason why you liked the way it was is because it maximizes the payment of support to your client. But, but, it, but it, and if we send it on a remand, it, it, I don't even know if it alters it. I think she, they, the, 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 you could still get, to, to Justice Luck's point, you still get to the same place if they fudge around with your client's earning capacity. No, I'm, I'm not arguing this only because it maximizes the mother's support. I'm, I'm also arguing it because that expense is necessary to fulfill the earning capacity. The earning capacity itself is a fiction. Rule 1910.16-2 says the earning capacity is imputed to a party who would incur, would. Would is a conditional verb. It, it suggests a condition that does not exist. The condition that does not exist is if the party were employed. So the rule, Rule 1910.16, Point two, itself acknowledges that hypothetical earning capacity and hypothetical child care expenses should be considered by the court. Now, it's if we not, deduct... It's, it's not maybe. Or it, it, it says the trier of fact shall consider right. reasonable child care responsibilities and expenses when imputing income. But we can't deduct them from income because it mathematically we leads could. to a different... It mathematically what leads is, to is, a different. What does consider mean? Does consider mean just think wax poetically about it? I mean, does it? What is it? No, I suggest. I, mean, I suggest that the fact that it's read in pari materia you, with the oh, other rule. Now that's interesting. Your argument is consider means go to sixteen six. Right. Oh. And maybe that's possible. I mean, it says shall consider. But one thing that didn't happen here is the trial court in imputing income did not consider in imputing income the reasonable child care expenses, uh, 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 reasonable expenses. It, did, it just didn't do it. I mean, so, you know, if, if he considered it in his head and said, geez, I'm not going to take it into account in imputing the income, I'm going to do it somewhere else, that's a mystery to anybody who's reading what's happening here. No, I think the court did consider them at the beginning. They considered the fact that she would need child care in order to work full time as a teacher as she had before. They decided that the the that if they handled the child care expenses by allocating them, that that would enable them to hold her to the same earning capacity. I understand that, but I mean, I'm just looking at this from a purely dollars and cents point of view. She's being imputed income of 52.20 a month and being added to that amount expenses that she would have had to have incurred in order to earn 52.20 a month. That's what in practicality happened here. And that doesn't make any sense because she would not have been earning, she would have been earning 52.20 a month, but before she brought that money home, she would have had to pay reasonable child care expenses. So this was imputing an income and then adding on to the income, adding on to that amount, the reasonable child care expenses. Now, maybe that's, maybe there was a rationale for the trial court doing that, but I don't understand it because that's being paid for imputed work that you're doing and then being compensated for the imputed child care expenses that would have been occurred but weren't. So it's sort of an add-on. No, to the it's, they offset each other. They don't, they aren't additive, they offset each other. By imputing her with the earning capacity, they're the reducing the amount of child support she would otherwise get. So if they had deducted the child care expenses, and I don't agree that that's proper, just like I don't believe if a, if a parent is living with a family member rent-free that we should reduce. I don't think that the, the support guidelines that the income shares model contemplates that. And similarly, in this case, if, she, um, if, if her child care, if it had been uh, subtracted from her income, she would have gotten a little more child support than if we didn't consider child care expenses at all. But mathematically, it would have been different. That's why we don't deduct it 
from incomes. We allocate it because there's a big mathematical difference between adding and de de deducting from income versus allocating the actual expense. Well, I, I hope that makes sense to you because <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense to me and maybe it's that I've never practiced in this domestic relations area, but it seems backwards to me and I'm going to have to try to try to figure it out unless you want to give it one more stab. I, I just I just <laughs> keep coming back to the, the question of why we why we need to complicate the matter mm -hmm. by adding in a provision that deals with paid, which we don't have here, and documentation, which we don't have here, when we have the tools to do it with 16-2. Right. And you may get a higher you may get a higher number on remand. Or a lower. Or a lower or the same. But that seems to be the, the, the paradigm, the rubric that should have been applied. But even under the new rule on a remand, the trial court is going to need this court's guidance on whether or not these kinds of expenses can be, can be considered and where, whether they have to be deducted from income or. You're asking us to rewrite the rule. The rule currently says shall consider. But I think, counsel, if I can go back to what Justice Dougherty said, and this is where I think I have been confused, and, and I want to just make sure I understand this. The procedural posture here is a little interesting in the sense that this wasn't a petition by your client seeking a change of child support. This was a request by the father to modify his support obligation because the mother went on sabbatical. Well, not because of that, because he actually was earning less. Okay, so he was earning less, but the but the issue of child but the issue of the child care expense came up, and in the context of reducing his child his his support obligation, um, the argument was made made by the father that oh, and by the way, um, there are no child care expenses anymore. And therefore, I shouldn't have to, that should not be part of my support obligation because she's at home. And I think that does look at 16.6.2, and maybe that's why the trial court focused on it. But in the reality, the reality of it was there was a second step, which was, oh, okay, you're, you're, you want us to reduce your child care obligation because it hasn't been, because there's no child expense actually paid. That's fine, but now we have to go back and look at the mother's earning capacity all over again under 16.2, and that didn't happen. So, Your Honor, to address your, Am I, please to summarize I right? it. Am what's I right? <laughs> I got a little bit lost towards the end there. So did I. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. That's fine. To summarize it, Your Honor, what, what my argument is, is that in the process, this fictional process of imputing an earning capacity, the rule says we have to consider child care expenses. The model, the, the, the way that we calculate child support in this case does not permit it to be deducted from income. It just doesn't. And it would be, it would be, it would mess up that much. <laughs> It would, it would make sense, so we can't do that. The only way that we can do that, consistent with this scientific mathematical model, is to allocate it at the end. Thank you. Thank you.